So let's call the meeting to order at 6.05. Hi, everyone. You'll notice we, I don't know that we've, we've achieved what Bob wanted, but at least we're a little bit closer than we usually are with that sort of cloth thing. We're trying to make it a bit small, the circle a bit smaller. Um, before we um, get on to anything on the agenda, I just wanted to um, tell the public a couple of things, and we have a couple of, and I have a couple of reminders for the board. Uh, first of all, um, we decided at the end of the meeting, last meeting, and for those of you who weren't there, I want to make sure this is on the record and that, and that people who frequently come to the meetings uh, know this now. Um, in, in an effort to keep our meetings less than hours and hours and hours, two times a month, um, Four and a half hours to be exact yes, <laughs> we welcome comments. Anybody can speak uh, from the public, but there will be a time limit on the um, comments. We ask for a two-minute limit. Additionally, going forward, anybody, of course, is welcome to submit a letter to the board. Um, we, and if you'd like to read the letter because you're here, fabulous. But if you are not here, the letter will not be read aloud. It will be put in the public record. Um, so the, going forward, those are two new, um, two new things that we have for the audience or uh, for our, um, our public. And then a, a reminder to the board, um, a, a recap of last month, and um, and you'll note um, at the end of the agenda, I've included another uh, reflection time to, to reflect back on how well we do on this. We're going to really try to continue to um, more strictly adhere to Robert's rules as we discuss topics. And a reminder that that means for each topic, we're going to limit um, we're going to limit a um, board member's time to speak on a topic to, to two times, and we're going to ask that everybody have the opportunity to speak first before you speak again. Okay, and additionally, there'll be a two-minute uh, limit on on those remarks. Um, so those are just some some reminders and some um, and some uh, news for the audience. So uh, amendments to the agenda. I am going to add an executive session at the end of the night for personnel to follow up on last month. Um, we will do that. Is there any? Um, additionally, number four, which is the student advisory council presentation, they understood uh, their time to be next meeting, so they'll come to the next meeting. They are not here tonight, okay? However, yep. we may want to push them to January because the next meeting, I believe, is in Reading. Okay. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, we could, why don't we do that? If you could, if you could tell them that. <laughs> yeah, you're right, we don't. Thank you. Okay, so we'll do that, have them in the January meeting. Um, and uh, do we have any other amendments to the agenda? Mary Beth? I don't feel so great. If so. No? No? Anybody else? No? Okay. So first, uh, public comment. Welcome everybody who's here. Um, is there anybody who'd like to make a comment? You have two minutes to do it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, okay, no student advisory. Uh, superintendent's report. There we go. Um, so a couple things in the superintendent's report. Uh, first of all, I, I did want to apologize. We've had some challenges with our data. Um, so the numbers here are, are still not wh where they need to be for our December enrollment. So we will give you an up-to-date no, um, report at the next meeting. We're just trying to work out a couple things from Alma. Uh, nothing so this number you don't feel is accurate? Yeah, well, there's some, some, some questions that I have in the data. For example, grade 12 at one column says 77 and the next column they say 85. Yeah. So we, we need to figure out what happened there. I don't think it will have a massive change in the enrollment, but I, I want to be sure that you're getting good data. So we will fix that at the, the next meeting. Um, what I would like to do next is just um, let the um, board know that you have information regarding 
um, some tax information that has come out at the state level and a link to an article that talks a little bit about that. So at this time of year, the, the tax office sends a letter to, the letter to the legislature letting them know what they anticipate um, projected tax increases might be for the education fund. This is a number that's a projection. Um, it is not something that that um, is cast in stone by any means. Um, it, but it is something that is of, of value for us to think about. Um, currently, at the state level, they are, they are projecting a 6% increase um, in um, taxes for this year, with a 5% increase in expenses. Um, again, an example might be, I believe it was in 2017, or they had um, projected a 9% increase. It came in substantially lower. So until all of this, the towns pass their budgets and they actually know what all the expenses are, it is, it is um, purely a projection, but it's worthy of note and is indicative of the, the ongoing challenge in the state to fund public education. Um, uh, next, I, I have for you some, some feedback that was requested on um, school choice students at the, the Woodstock Union High School. Um, one of the questions was <laughs> how many school choice students we have in each grade level. Mm -hmm. So you see the numbers there. We currently have zero students in ninth grade, two students in tenth grade, and four students each in eleventh grade and twelfth grade. Um, in talking with Mr. Smale, there, there's currently no known um, siblings of um, students that would be interested in coming in for school choice. Um, and the other thing was just to, to give you some additional thinking about this particular issue as we look later on in the meeting to make a determination, or you look to make a determination about how many school choice openings to have. Um, school choice students can either help classes and sports teams be viable, having extra students there, um, or they can be adding more numbers can be problematic to classes or teams that are oversubscribed. So um, it can it can go either way. Um, it is important for you to know if there was a situation in which there was a behavioral concern for somebody that was a school choice, um, the school choice agreement can be severed. So if, if there is a situation where there's not a good fit, um, that is something that can be severed. Um, and that currently we have more students from other towns looking for school choice openings than we have available each year. I know the, the actual vote and discussion will be later in the meeting, but I wanted to um, get you the information that you had requested. So is our, is our number now set at 10, and that's why we didn't take any for this year? Right, correct. <laughs> Um, and next in the superintendent's report is um, uh, some, an update from the Director of Student Support Services. However, we can go right to the source. And Sherry, would you like to sure. just give a, a quick update? We spent two days, myself, um, Mary Guggenberger from Killington, um, John Hansen from Reading, and Hannah um, Tyne from Barnard, as well as Hannah Leland from here, working with the State Safety um, Commission. These are ex state troopers who inform us around safety practices. So we spent two days working on emergency operations plans, updating on us what are the current FBI recommendations, what are the considerations we have. They offered us a template for developing an emergency operation plan. We're in that process. Um, what's nice about this plan is that it's digital, so people can take it. It can be brought on a phone, a device, so if we have to evacuate a space, it does everything from what happens if there's severe weather to active shooter. And what are the changing philosophies and responses to um, intruders in the building, what considerations we have. Um, so we've begun that revision. Um, I'm now going to be working with Hannah Leland from the middle school high school, as well as John Hansen to get the input around each building. It'll be as precise as having photographs on shutoff valves for each building to as what does an emergency cafe and post look like. So um, it's about 200 pages already, but what's great about it is you can take it anywhere. We'll have hard copies in each of the principles. They will be also available to first responders, um, other community resources, so that we can all have a shared understanding of what the plan is. And it's a district-wide, so one of the reasons, you know, having a merged district plan, it's going to be the same practice, procedures, approaches in every building with the individual idiosyncrasies of each building as well. So 
we all know what our what the role of the teacher is, what the role of the principal is, what the role of the administrative assistant. So that'll all be in that emergency operations plan. So we hope to get it to a point of <clears throat> a first draft, um, and then we'll begin, and it will be electronic, so we can update it constantly as people change. Um, memorandums of understandings with law enforcement, all those kinds of things can be all part of that document. So it's good work. Thank you. Um, about a year ago, I think we were at the Reading meeting, we had gone over the list of things about your safety, things at every building. Mm -hmm. um, I forget who had put that together. Do, have, do we have a completion list of those types of things, like the lighting and the doors and all that stuff that had come through? So we, we submitted a grant for all of that, and I believe we are still waiting. Yeah, we should know in the week, next week or two, I checked in with them. Okay. Um, so we put in for $125,000 worth of work, about 25000 for every building. Much of that work was based on the report that came from Marcos Healy that we did a year ago. Um, well, and in addition, some other pieces that need to be done, so much such large pieces, like a containment space here at the middle school and high school, that's huge bucks. But there are other smaller things, lighting cameras, door locks, those kinds of things that we were able to put into that grant. So we should know in the next week or two, uh, because it has to be spent by July 1. And so I spoke with them last, when we met, and said, we need to know. And so they, they we should hear in the next week. Um, do, you, do you think that this might um, eventually, sooner or later, intersect with the need for any policy revisions, or do you think this is so procedural? Really for it, um, the policy work is a big piece that needs to be taken care of. We need additional, and we I put in for a grant last year. We did have 10000 set aside for that policy piece. It's something that we're going to work on, everything from... <clears throat> what happens when we film kids on those cameras? What happens to that? That's a policy that we really need to have for, for, for <coughs> protection. But there's a range of policies, and so we're getting there. But it's really, Pam, it's such important work, and we need to have some concentrated. It's part of my job. It's a big job. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a lot it of seems like to me, um, that it would be great for the policy committee to get a list of all of the mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. or something like that. Sure. Yeah, and it was in that article. Was healing the Great. Thank you. Okay, great. Anything else? Uh, just a very uh, two two other things very quickly. At um, with the last superintendent's report, we had talked about a, a partnership that we continue to foster with um, Dartmouth. And we, we talked about a senior design challenge course that we are partnering, partnering with. Um, at the time, we were still working back and forth about what that actual design will be. Um, and there's been a number of iterations of that. And where we have finally landed is that we will have um, the seniors at Dartmouth actually work on one of our strategies and our strategic plan, which involves externship programs which are designed to help our educators integrate with local and regional businesses so that they have um, working knowledge of how their particular content areas are applied out in the work world um, and to also foster those relationships so that we can um, hopefully connect students in with these community partnerships. So we're, we're excited about this. Um, this is a uh, a major project for these students, and it will give us a lot of capacity in terms of meeting that particular strategy. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll be hearing from um, our Director of Finance and Operations this evening, Mike Concessi, about some initial projections around Comp and Ben for the expense budget. Um, I, I do want to continue to say to this board that, first of all, that team is working incredibly hard long hours, um, looking to get um, things where they need to be as we work through this particular transition. Um, so, you know, we, we ask you to continue to be patient. Um, I can tell you that excellent quality work is being done. Um, every member of that team is, is working overtime to, to get us the, the right numbers for this budget, but I, I did want to, first of all, commend the, the team that we have in place and the efforts that they're making. And again, let you know that we, we are a little bit behind in terms of where we'd like to be um, given uh, some very significant transition issues. Can we go back to page three for a second? Is the um, district enrollment 
I believe I keep on asking. Maybe it's maybe I'm not being heard. Um, this is a total enrollment. Uh, when we're doing our budgets, we need to know that per pupil are actually equalized students in our school. So when I see Killington Elementary School, and I pick up that they have whatever, you know, it's it's half of that. And the way that the state, with the letter that we all got in our package, the state takes the total cost, and you divide only the cost of the people that are actually in your district. So as opposed um, to students who are for choice. Yeah. So so I look at this, and I, if we do have a thousand and six, okay, then you go to the next page where it shows us that there's ten that are um, school choice students that we have no credit for at all. We don't get to count them, and we don't even get any money for them as being tuition. Um, that takes 10 off of that. I believe Killington actually has about 40. Well, I think what we could do going forward, you know, is when we, this is now part of the superintendent's report regularly where we see, which we didn't forever see, right. the number of students we even had. So I think going forward, we can figure out a model that, that um, also says, you know, how many students are choice out, you know, just. Uh, how many are choice and how many right. are, how are, equal, are equalized? And they, the equalized pupil number has a number of, of different calculations associated with that. I was, I was just actually meeting with Raf today. He was going to reach out to Brad James. Typically, we get that number from the state. We're going to try to see if we can actually go through the calculations ourselves but to that, be able to bring it to the final. But even aside from that, but when I, when the I, when choice, I, the, the number cho of choice, choice students. We can definitely pull out the choice students from that so that you see that. Um, you know, in terms of tuition, that would have to be another report that we'd work on. Um, but that's something that we could do if that would be helpful well, to I, I mean, just once again, I believe I'd ask for another column that would point that out. I understand that the state has a different calculation. The state uses a two-year prior um, number, averaging, whichever way they average it out. Um, but it would be really good as a board member, especially anyone that's trying to learn about the financing side, you know, what our actual per pupil equalized count yeah. is. Good. No, uh, we'll talk it through with Mary Beth and figure out how we can add a column there that, that is a number that we can reflect accurately each month. Thank okay. you. Yep. Okay. Um, I'll just, let's see. Okay, so now we've got reports of the board. Um, I don't have a report particular chair, vice chair report, so I can skip right to finance. Uh, we met as a um, committee this week, we're going to meet, or la uh, last Friday, we're going to meet again this Friday. Um, obviously, this is our time of year, really trying to figure out um, what our budget looks like. As Mary Beth just said, um, thank you, Mike. His department's working really hard, and, and we are a little behind on this, and that is... Um, due in part to the fact that 19 is not closed yet. Um, and uh, so there's there's work that needs to be done. You know, tonight we're gonna start to talk about the expense side of it, but you know, the other important part is the revenue side, which, which is a real work in progress right now. Um, so we'll, we're gonna start at the end of tonight's meeting to present to you um, what, it's, what it's gonna look like um, as you, I hope you guys took some time to read through what Mary Beth put in the report. There are important letters from the state. Um, for those of you who are new to the um, to the board and for whom this is your first um, budget, <laughs> welcome <laughs> to the fun. Um, so anyway, we'll keep going. We have another meeting. We'll, we'll talk tonight and uh, take your comments back with us, and we'll have another meeting this Friday. We need to hash it through. Okay. Um, policy? Do you have any report? Um, well, aside you know, from we what have, we're going to do later. We just have the two things to bring forward. We haven't met since the last meeting, so not, nothing much to say except we're going to be putting second reads for two policies. And, um, and what's on your plate other than once these pass, what, what's on the plate right now? Um, About 30. Yeah, I can look it up, and when we bring these forward, I will tell, because I have okay. a whole list. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, okay, uh, community engagement. Oh, my daughter needed me. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so we um, 
we are doing great. We had a really nice press release that went out about our STEM programs. I hope people saw those in the local papers, um, highlighting both what's happening at the middle and high school and at Kellington Elementary School. Um, we've got the tours up and running of the facility and they've been really successful. People are coming and are engaged and are really appreciative of an opportunity to see the facility and hear more, so that's been really great. Um, Allison Clarkson last week was like, oh, this is true public engagement. <laughs> on average, how many people are coming on the tour? Um, we've had between 15 and 30 oh, okay. on, each like, tour. on each tour. Yeah. I didn't count today, Sherry. Did it you? was about thirty. Probably about mm -hmm. thirty. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. are they from all of all, all the towns? Just, all the yep. Towns. All towns so far. Right. We've had people from all of the towns. Great. Um, so that's been really exciting. Um, Sam finally has, as of today, social media access. Yeah, as of like an hour ago. So I'm I'm literally just gonna do all the things, and I want to just touch base with. Well, we be, be, be sure to be get in contact with Raina or Raph about whatever it is that I'm doing or posting before I do it, just to make sure that, you know, we're not um, overlapping each other and you guys are com comfortable with it. And then I've also created accounts on French Front Porch Forum and Listserv, and I've been posting um, the... Um, press releases on there and the fact that you know uh, when our um, people can come for the tours and how to go about doing that so yeah it's, it's coming together um, our next um, press release went out yesterday and that is highlighting the ways in which our community are involved in Wassail Weekend. We have, I want to highlight this because I think it's so cool, we have 79 community, community members involved in a Christmas Carol that's going to be this weekend, um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and that involves elementary schoolers, 12 elementary schoolers, 40 middle and high schoolers, and 27 adults and other teens from the community who are all participating. So it's a real community event, so super excited about that. Um, so highlighting the ways in which our school community are involved in Los at Weekend. Then we'd like to do a series of press releases highlighting our district elementary schools and the exciting things that are happening at each elementary school. We'd like to start with Reading, um, highlight them first. And so we're going to be reaching out to the principals and faculty and staff at the different elementary schools to find out what's happening so we can do press releases around that. And then the next middle school, high school facility information that we um, send out via press releases will focus on why the board voted to approve the June 10th resolution to pursue the financial feasibility of a new bill. So that's where we are. Am I forgetting anything? Very good. Yeah, so those are, that's what we're working on. Great. Thank you. Uh, um, or, 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 or. Sure, I'll take it. Um, so, picking up where I guess Claire left off, thanks to you know, board members, members of the public who've taken the middle school and high school tour. I think what we're seeing as a result of folks taking the tour is uh, Bob and I are starting to you know get folks kind of referred over to us to field questions, and that's um, that's been great. And, and thanks for um, for kicking people over to us and keep the questions coming. We've had some really good dialogue with the community members. Um, Following the vote to proceed we had the last uh, board meeting, we uh, reached out to Lee Sherwood on timing uh, in terms of getting engaged with the next phase. Um, just based on holiday schedules, travel, that sort of thing, it looks like we're going to um, be kicking that off after the new year. We're still trying to line up uh, an exact date, but probably first, second week of January is what we're going to be looking at to get the architect engaged. The top priority of that uh, work, as we you know, talked about uh, last time around, was is the geo borings. And I uh, talked to Lee, um, his uh, point on that is, you know, as long as uh, there's access to the site, uh, weather, uh, you know, permitting, then that shouldn't be a problem with it, you know, getting into the, the frozen, you know, season. So as long as it's not really too, you know, soupy or, you know, too much snow, like three feet to get equipment out there, uh, it shouldn't present much of a, uh, much of a time constraint. Uh, on the funding front, in terms of like the, the work uh, for that next phase, we are uh, continuing to pursue um, private and grant funding and have some uh, sources lined up and are working on that. Um, there's some, uh, I guess I won't give any particular details <coughs> on where we're applying, but uh, that's uh, another aspect of what's keeping us busy. Uh, any questions for me? 
Oh, we need to set that. We'll need to set that. It'll probably be after the New Year as well, given the holiday uh, schedules coming up. Thank you. Uh, yes, I could tell the policy could, uh, information oh, now. Sure, great. Okay. Oh, I have a question before that. Sure. Back to Ben. Um, the last motion in seven and the minutes of last the uh, last meeting to authorize the superintendent to enter into the contract. Mm -hmm. It says the board would like to have some clarity about exactly what would in, what would include so the um, first phase. Do we have an update on that? I know you just said the geo, but we did say we'd like to know what exactly this report would include. Sure. Uh, apologies, I didn't realize there was an open action item um, coming from the last meeting. Before the last meeting, we had provided a breakdown by phase of the three phases of the work that was previously proposed by the architect. And my understanding was that the um, decision by the board last uh, meeting was to proceed with phase one as described. I, I, I'm just going by the minutes here. It wasn't the prior meeting, it was the last minute, the last meeting. And I was expecting us to get something from the architect telling us exactly what because the, the question here is the board would like to have some clarity about exactly what would be included that's all so if, if prior to um engaging the architect in january if we or someone at his firm could come up with what the 130 what what services that wasn't the sure we, blue? Yeah. Was but is, that, should, is that i mean that was but is that exactly 130 blue that's my understanding, and we haven't um, put the contract together yet for the next phase. We can include those details, um, we can circulate that to the board. Okay. Why don't we Why don't we plan on getting just a list of one? If in fact it's just exactly what's in blue, then we'll send out something to us that will have the one thirty. Just confirm that with Lee. Okay, we'll do. Okay. Thank you. Jim, would that be satisfactory? Would yes. it also be possible to have the? Um, we talked about this last time. The the. The architect's proposal with the breakdowns before it got so sp to the specific number that it did. I know that some board members received that via email, but would it be possible for that to be a part of the board book or to be more substantially a part of our record? Well, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. If no one else wants to speak, then I guess I get my second one. Is there anybody else who would like to say something? Yes. The blue is not going to work. It's, it's, it's just. It's not specific enough. There were some questions in there about site planning onto. You had a town manager from Killington speak at Killington, saying, you know, I mean, it says, it, it states in that blue report, if I had it in front of me, that um, there would be some site planning or whatever, but exactly what? You know, is it going to take into account the wetlands? Are, you, are they actually hiring on a person for wetlands consulting? Are they hiring somebody on for the, from the, are they bringing someone in from the ANR for the river setbacks? Once again, it's just, the concern here is that we're moving ahead trying to architect a building before seeing what the um, land is actually capable of holding. Yeah. So. Right. In some of the earlier reporting, I forget which one, but I'm sure we could find it and provide it out. They did do some preliminary work, including referencing borings from two different two different times in floodplain maps and stuff are all included in the report. So I agree that you know you want to know exactly what's happening, but I, I don't think it's that extreme level where there's there was not a race in consideration of that because maps of the floodplains, the other boring results and stuff are already in the, the initial one of the one of the reports that came from Lee in group. Um, I just don't remember which which one. Yeah, how it's how it's sectioned off on the WCSU website, but it is something that is publicly publicly posted. And I'd be happy to find again and build the site it out. Thank okay. you. Okay. Why don't we price it price it sometime in the next two weeks? You could do that. That would be great. And if you were able to contact Lee, I think before our first meeting in January, take it something in writing with him. Just sure. you know, like this is the one third. We are we're now. I'm going to accept 130. This is what we will be able to do for that amount of money. Yeah, sounds okay. Good. Mm -hmm. I think what we could do is just, but, we could just put a scope of work with that with this next agreement. Yeah. 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 yeah it's as specific as we can be. Right. I mean, there's there's certain things that we're not going to be able to cover, and we're not going to know. But there are certain things that we certainly can cover. So as much as they can give us, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah. 
Okay, Ben, is that a yeah, reasonable cool. charge for you? Sure. Okay. Okay, uh, Paul, uh, Pamela. The policy continues. Yep. Um, uh, so we're, we're going to continue talking about the following things. These are things that we started talking about last month. Um, Intradistrict choice policy, drug policy, allergy policy, and transgender and gender nonconforming student policy. For some of those, um, Sherry was uh, in going to invite some, some people, and uh, I can ask now. Fantastic. So um, we'll get some consultation with uh, people that are more intimately knowledgeable about some of those things to continue the, uh, developing those policies. And then we also have on our list to start talking about naming rights policy and a policy, well, to talk about uh, parent complaints, um, to talk about that a little bit. It's an initial thing, so I don't know, even know if it will be a policy, but a discussion. Okay. What was, I think you gave four, four where you said you were continuing to talk yeah. about the logistic choice. Drug, drug policy, drug. allergy policy. Allergy, got it. Okay. Thank you, Pamela. Yep. Um, buildings and grounds. I uh, had our first meeting, uh, fairly uneventful, but just wanted to to say, you know, we, we went over with Joe, kind of, kind of just went over the report that he presented to us last September, I think that had the facility by, by facility breakdown of things that needed to be done. And Joe spent a little bit of time just kind of uh, very broadly list, you know, highlighting things that are a little higher priority, meaning things that he thinks need to be addressed in the next two to five years. Uh, but I think our goal um, is gonna be to really um, continue to dive into that a little bit deeper and try to get some time frames and make sure that the, the board is aware of items at all the campuses, um, you know, if there's something that is more immediate, like in the next couple of years. Uh, bond or no bond, there's there's some issues that need to be addressed and maybe even band-aided in the meantime, even if we think a bond's going to go through. So um, we thought it was pretty important to prioritize those. Uh, we discussed a little bit uh, looking at something that is a facility's priority uh, versus some of the things that might be um, still important, but, but uh, items that support the profile of the graduate or strategic plan, but they're not actually like a roof caving in, right? So kind of being able to take that list and, and break it down into a couple different categories. Uh, so I would just say, I know that we, most of the uh, groups here have some member of administration involved, and I'm hoping to take a little pressure off Joe as far as if, if there's questions from any of the other committees or like at the board meetings, I took the notes you just mentioned, Patty, about asking about the security audit, but just more than happy to, to take that stuff back and talk to Joe and bring it to you guys at this time frame at each meeting, you know, so he's not getting lots of individual emails, so, which I'm an offender of doing myself asking, so, but I thought it would be good for, for Joe to have a place to build this. I just center that and I can report out on a regular basis since Joe's not here every, every two weeks, so. Thank you. Um, all right, well, he hasn't met yet. We have scheduling issues with our group. Issues. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and nobody has the same schedule in our group, so if somebody could possibly change jobs, we're going to figure out. Like, pretty much, you know, Mary Beth has a busy schedule at the end of the year. We're going to meet in January and kick things off. So it's not like it's something that's pressing today. Uh, I think we have other things that are pressing, but we will be getting together and kicking things off. Then. So. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, negotiations? We are just on hold until... Uh, the mediator decides on what the outcome is going to be. Yeah. Uh, Wait. So <laughs> campus configuration is not on oh, I'm sorry. We actually haven't met. We were sorry. scheduled for last <laughs> so been for Monday. <laughs> but that was um, canceled because yeah. of the storm. It's uh, warned for next the 19th. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, next we have the consent agenda. In our consent agenda, we have the meeting, the minutes from November 25th. Motion to approve. Second. I'm accepting Second. a grant. Is the grant included in the consent agenda? Yeah. Uh, do you want to speak at all to that? I mean, I hadn't heard of any about this. Yeah, I mean, I, it, this is a, a group that has been working around looking at ways that we can look at high school programming related to food challenges, relating to um, agriculture and forestry. Um, and one of the things that this group is looking to do is to really have students engage 
um, in this in this work, um, as well as developing some curriculum, uh, potentially getting to the place where there may be a certificate that students graduate with, kind of like the Seal of Five Literacy. Um, and so this was a grant that is funding some of their work, $25,000, which is pretty exciting. And who's um, the faculty liaison or member who's? Uh, Kat, 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 Kat Robbins. Kat, Kat Robbins, she's okay. at, with the National Park Liaison. Okay. So I, I think it's an exciting piece for our district. It ties right into the stewardship aspect of our portrait. Yep. Um, and is certainly an area that connects well to the sense of place that we have here and the resources that we have here. Anything you want to add to that, Gary? Yeah, I mean, it was great. Kat did all the work, all the research. I didn't do any of it. And she right. successfully received it. So that, great. Great. And she has a team in addition to herself. So it's not just a one person show. There's a, a group of teachers and community members with this project as well. Okay. <coughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay. So we had discussion. So and we had, um, all in favor of the consent agenda, approving the consent agenda? All right. Okay. Okay. Next. Um, on our time scheduled appointments, we have the Union Arena Endowment. Paige is going to speak to this because I don't know anything about <coughs> And Paige has some history, so she's going to give us. So the Union Arena, many, many years ago, was turned over to the high school along with its trust. Um, and occasionally, the Union Arena will come to us to ask for monies to support some things that need to be done within the rink. Um, the trust has grown. We're now at 590, 590,000, thank you, um, which is a, a great balance for the endowment. They're asking for us to bring 7750 out of the endowment to help them replace uh, their pump system. Um, I see no reason why we shouldn't give that monies to them. Um, their last ask was probably about five years ago for about $35,000. Um, and before that, I think it was maybe three years before that for another maybe 30, I think, if my memory. More in that range. Yeah. Um, so this is a very small ask, in my opinion. I think it's reasonable to support them on this. Um, any questions or? I'll make a motion to approve the purchase of the uh, pump system, um, I as mobile, whatever, WGX 20-23 Grump Finder. Do I have $7,750. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Yeah, Here's a question for discussion. Yeah. Uh, grinder pumps, these are for the septic system? I believe so, yes. Okay. Waste station pumps. Waste yeah, okay. station pumps. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Any okay. other questions? All those in favor of the motion on the table, say aye. 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 All those opposed, the ayes have it. The motion has been passed. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mary Beth, the F21 calendar. I know this seems early to start talking about it because we usually talk about it in um, April. But, um, you know, it's sort of always been brought to us when it's a little bit of a fait accompli, like here's the schedule, here's the calendar. Um, this year, Mary Beth did meet with the, Hart, with the principal at Hartford Tech, and, and um, they asked for some of our input and, and the other schools that go to the Hartford Technical Center. So Mary Beth's going to sort of talk us through. This is very preliminary, but <coughs> we should like some feedback from us on um, some, <coughs> some recommendations she might give to them. It doesn't mean we're going to get it. It's just... Yeah, so to frame this a little bit, and for, again, folks that, that may be newer to the board, Typically, the way it has worked is that our district tries to align our calendar with the Hartford <coughs> Technical Center so that when we, we have students that, that spend half their time there, that, that the days are matching up, right? Does that make sense? Um, and so the, the Hartford Technical Center has put out their first draft of what they are going they are recommending for next year. There are some things that I, I think are worthy of discussion, and so as a group, we ask them to go back to our boards, get some feedback, and provide you with that feedback before you publish your final calendar. 
um, while while we do not need to align absolutely day to day, obviously the closer that we can get to it, the better. Um, so a couple things that I, I wanted to share with you. First of all, in your packet you have um, the recommended calendar um, that 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 we would put out there. That I, that that is when I met with SLT, our leadership team, they're recommending this version, and then you have the current draft from the Harvard Technical <coughs> Center. A um, couple of issues is that currently the Harvard Tech Center has the first day of school on 826, um, which, which backs us up um, to having teachers come back on August 21st. Um, one of the things that we currently have in our contract is that teachers can't come back before the first Monday prior to Labor Day. Labor Day is very late this year. Um, so we would like to recommend with, with your support that the um, actual first start date uh, for students is 9-2, which pushes the, the teacher start time back a little bit later. Um, so that is that is one issue that we're looking at is the first day of class um, is is very very early um, again particularly given that Labor Day is so late. The other thing that is currently in their calendar is that they are looking at um, having kids get out for the holiday break on December 18th. However, the, the, uh, the 24th, which is, is always a day that's off, doesn't fall until Thursday. So there is the ability to get the 21st, the 22nd, and the 3rd in for school days um, and still have the 24th off and move on. Um, that would give the students a fair amount of time that they would have off prior to um, the Christmas holiday. Um, so one of the things that, that is a recommendation from the school leadership team is to start a little bit later but to pick up three of those days during the December break um, and then you get a sense of where we would we would come out in terms of the last day of school um, so those are some thoughts um, at this point we're just we're just giving feedback to the Harvard Technical Center and I'd be happy to take back whatever this board feels comfortable <coughs> terms of offering. Uh, so if they're, Hartford starts four days earlier than the Woodstock student or the Windsor Center student. Mm -hmm. Does that put them at a deficit in terms of four days that they're not going to the technical center? Well, we haven't decided this yet. I I'm mean, the one on the right yeah, is the suggested calendar. Right. So that just might and then she's going to, Mary Beth is going to try and bring back suggestions that we have in the hopes that they Right. So my question just comes from, are we putting them at any form of a deficit if they're going to be four days behind their peers? No, our expectation that, would, that our students would still start on that same day with Hartford. So if they had to like to go to the tech center, they would start early. Okay. And that's, that's not unusual. It's already almost every year, or every year, the Hartford starts one day earlier than we do. Sometimes it's two days, and so as long as we provide transportation from this facility, um, the access And we do, and we out. would still provide transportation even though the rest of the school right. is not functioning at that. That, so. would, that would, you know, there would be some financial impact to that, yep. right? Um, because um, we wouldn't actually be starting at that time, but we, we would continue to follow the procedures that would follow. Because relatedly, there was some discrepancy this calendar year, right, where they were going to be open while we were closed and we weren't able to provide transportation. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, what, what, when is Columbus Day this year? Yeah, we got that straight out. That was the first little more, yeah. So this, this yeah. has us off on Columbus Day. Um, so we so that my where I'm coming from is part of like so we were kind of setting setting some of our students up this year of they weren't able to get transportation to go on a day where school is in session. So that goes back to when you're factoring in the discrepancy in schedules that if as long as we're assuring they're gonna get transportation even when the rest of our district's not in in session, if that makes sense. And for these early start days, we would. Pamela. Um, speak just from parental experience. Um, 
I've always really liked the way that it works as a transition. I talked to other parents about this too. At the beginning of the year, if it starts on a Wednesday, then there's three days. The next week, there's Labor Day, so there's four days. So it's kind of like an easy transition back from summer with the three, four, five. People are certainly accustomed to it. Yes, it so that time. would be lost. But the, the bigger thing that I would... So you're uh, saying that's in support of the recommended calendar? That's in support of the HTC recommendation. Right. Sticking mm -hmm. with the pre-Labor Day start. Uh, but the, yeah. the post-Labor Day. Oh. Right, so that... The, but ours has that too. Yeah. The, one, the calendar First day of left. class is 9-2. So that's that would Wednesday. mean... It's a Wednesday. 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 Not oh, it's the same thing. Three, four, and five. What? Yeah. Sorry, when is Labor Day? The other one, I think we go three, seven, four. It's on the seven. It's so it works either way. Okay, that's fine. No, and, a, and well, actually, it, three, five, it goes on four, the Hartford one. We go three days, five days, then four days. Yeah. When okay. does Hartford start? August 26th? 26th. Yeah, that's that August 26th. But my, my larger concern is Second. that um, as, a, as a parent, mostly, but I think this would be a other people's complaint too. Going up to um, Christmas Eve, it really, it, it makes travel plans much more challenging. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's uh, frankly just kind of a bummer, like for the kids, and I know how upset they would be by that because they so look forward to, to that, and so it's like to wait until the very last minute to, um, especially for people that celebrate Christmas, it just seems kind of like, really? Ugh. So I, I just, um, you know, it's not an educational reason, but just in terms of people's lives and people's travel schedules and holiday schedules, I think that's a little tight, undesirable. My understanding, and Sherry, you may be able to, and Garen, is that that's, that's not atypical, that typically the day before the Christmas is off, but you go up to that day. That, that is not atypical from what I understand. But. I think it varies year to year. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes we've come right up to the 24th and sometimes it's the 23rd. Yeah. Um, well, we're, getting out, on the, we're getting out on the 23rd, mm -hmm. right? not the 24th. The 23rd. Right. 23rd, right. Well, yeah, so but you your first day off is Christmas day. Eve. Uh, yes. The Wednesday, the 23rd, usually it's a half day. It could be. It has been. It, could be. it, it has been, yeah. yeah. But this year, we're no, yeah. we have Just like no. No. Yeah. before Thanksgiving, it's usually half day, too. All I know is Christmas must go away. Okay, well, let's. Are there, are there other comments people want to make up? Uh, um, so are we talking about other things on the calendar as well, or just Sure, sure. Those? Whatever. No, whatever um, you want to talk about. Can we address the early release days? That, that, yeah, that's, 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 kind of a, that's a different problems. issue. Let's okay. just talk about, we, let's talk, we'll talk about the early release dates. Let's first talk about the actual calendar. Because oh, those, okay. Okay. are there other comments on the actual calendar for Mary Beth to take back to Hartford? Yes, Jim. Yeah, so we said that Hartford will start on the 26th of August. We're going to start on September 2nd. We're not saying we're not that we're saying doing, that. that is not what we're saying. We're, we're saying right now, <laughs> Hartford, I know, but we're not saying that we're starting earlier than there. I, there we're going to, this is Hartford's on the right hand side. As they asked, what would be your recommendations? Do you have any suggestions? We are, okay, Mary Beth is Jennifer, going to let go. Let me just them. rephrase it. Okay. What I have in front of me is on the right hand side is what Hartford suggested. Yes. What I have on the left to me is a recommended. Yes. Okay. I don't know who the recommendation is from. It would be from our district. Okay. So that's what I thought I said. So our recommendation is to start on <coughs> September 2nd. Correct. Their recommendation is to start on August 26th. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know for how long that we've been starting prior to, and I know you're going to say it's not, but we've been starting the last week of August. I'm going to pick up from where, where Pamela was coming from, okay, with this December 21st, 2nd, 3rd, not having, not having off. It will go to Garen. Normally, that's pushing it to the end of the report card period, yes or no? Where are you? December. <laughs> is that when we're ending one of our... I'm just Usually it goes to January. January is the end of the semester, so we do a... Um, there's a checkpoint at <laughs> the beginning of, of December, like a, a is five there, Is there period. testing going on in these three days? That's my in December, question. no. Typically, no. This year, the, the, um, the, that second semester is ending the third week in January. Third week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, question yeah. that we're not rushing it in before right. and I, having tested. I do want to make sure everybody understands because I think Gary Beth um, rushed through this part. Contractually, our teachers 
go back, or in our contract it says they should not, they will not go back before the Monday before, right, Labor Day. Absolutely. Labor Day is late this year. What day unless, is that? unless there's a mutual agreement. Unless there's a mutual so agreement. There, so we can certainly go to them and say, so, I mean, yes, Jim, we have always gone back just, at the end of... I have my question listen, that was answered. Listen for one second. We usually go back the end of August, okay? Because Labor Day has always been earlier. But it ha it isn't this year. It's a week later. So that's why we're looking at our contract and we're like, this could be a problem. And, you and I just wanted to make sure it wasn't interfering with testing. Testing, no. To make them test the week before, or two days before Christmas is a little... Yeah. Bob? Is the contractual reason the reason we can't go back the first... September, if we go back Tuesday the 1st? Well, if you go back on the 2nd, what happens is you get that 3, 4, 5 start like everybody likes and has been traditionally used to doing. If you went back, you could go back on the 1st, which would be a 4, 4, five. four 5. But traditionally, historically, we've gone back on a Wednesday. And then you have... Um, then you have Labor, you have Labor Day, Day the next week. So you've got four days, and then you have the following week, which you've got the five days. We have gone for at least, I'd say, the last eight to ten years, we've gone back the Wednesday before Labor Day. Right. I mean, that's when we've gone back. We, we could trade that for the 23rd of December. Could yeah. We? Yes. Yes, we could. That's what I do. I like that, too. Okay. But I also have to say, this is the first year that Hartford has asked for feedback from other districts, which is huge because they have always dictated the calendar and it hasn't always worked for all of the school districts, but we've had to follow it. So I think this is a really great start in communications because sure. we also, our numbers have changed historically from 10 to 20 kids who were originally went to the Hartford Tech Center to now, I think we're up to 40, maybe 50 kids. Yeah. yeah, so it's doubled in size, too, in participation. Um, is there any other feedback? I, mean, I, I like your idea, Bob. I do like the first or the 23rd. Is that something people like? I would prefer that. Half a day on the 22nd. Yeah, okay. So I, I think I think I'm hearing a recommendation to Mary Beth. Okay, the first be the start and the 23rd, 22nd will be the last day. Okay. Any other comments on the calendar people want to make? Just the calendar. We're not talking about just the calendar right now. Anything else on the calendar? No. Okay. Now, Mary Beth, want to address the. Um, Sure. So the, the other piece that you see on here is that there are four early release days over the course of the year um, to reduce um, time teachers are released from classes to engage in professional activities. So one of the things that we are seeing is a, a real challenge related to substitutes. Um, and they're, they're, part of the issue is the lack of subs, but the other part is the amount of time that our teachers need to be out of the classroom in order to engage in other, some other really critical professional work, such as curriculum design, such as looking at data from assessments and determining what, you know, where they're going to go next, how that's going to inform their instruction. And with, without that early release time, what we're finding is that we have to pull teachers from classrooms, put substitutes in, um, and that, that is creating a challenge in terms of the amount of time that teachers are out of the classrooms, and it's also creating a challenge in terms of being able to um, fund, or, or to actually um, find substitutes. And there's also a cost aspect to that as well. Um, so again, this this is very preliminary feedback, but we we are making the recommendation that one of the ways in which we could address this is to have four early release days over the course of the year that would be focused on some of this curriculum work, some of these data team types of meetings that would reduce the amount of times that we would need to put subs into classrooms. Um, and so, and but we can still have our teachers engaged in this really curriculum critical professional work. 
we had this in front of us, I think, three years ago for uh, board members that were not on the board at the time. Um, I thought we worked into, we said no to the idea of it not, not having. One a, it was not one a quarter. It, it was, was it, more than that. Well, whatever. Yeah. Okay, but we said no. And I thought that in replacement of it, there was some teacher development days that were put into prior to the start of school. Are we looking of um, keeping those prior days also? The other question that I have is, I believe back three years ago, the questioning was of busing during a half a day or whatever. Um, I don't know if, I think when we were talking about this, that there wasn't going to be busing. I'm not definite on that, but I think that was the answer, that there would not be busing. So children would be coming in here, and then at 12 o'clock, I guess, half day or 11 o'clock. And then the, um, I understand the stress on the school, and I understand the stress on the teachers because of going for their professional development and everything else. But there is also the stress on the families that don't have um, those days off. So that's where I leave that. I'm not sure. Um, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure I know why we voted no. Uh, it could have been a whole different board back then. Got it. Um, it. A lot of it was. And it was I don't think it was as long as three years ago, Jim. But oh, pardon me. It wasn't as long as three years Thank ago. Um, and it, a lot of it was the child, you know, people and child care, and considering their need for child care. Um, and I think a lot of it too was, you know, four and a half days is two days the kids aren't in the classroom. You know, if we um, you know, being on the being on the negotiations committee and knowing, you know, how every minute that the teachers are engaged in everything, anything we have to account for somehow. But you know, I think if this, um, you know, everyone's got to put a little more skin in the game as things get more difficult, and time has to be found somewhere where our kids aren't losing education time. I can't, I can't see in this district how we can justify two more full days that our kids aren't in front of educators. And I can't see asking parents, um, you know, to miss a day of work. And some of these, a lot of these are on Fridays. You know, if you, if you run a business, people who ask for Friday afternoons off are not your favorite employees. We're not putting people in a, in a great position, I, I think, in their, in their work environments. Um, you know, if we wanted to use this and then say, for the kids, leave them in the facilities by and bring people in. You know, bring in a bullying person one time. Bring in some, you know, drug and alcohol education. If you know, if we were going to do something else with that time, that was beneficial, either to the school community or you know to the students themselves. I can see it, but otherwise, I I can't honestly support two more days of the kids not in front of teachers. Yeah, um, I echo Jim's and Patty. But I also would like to say that I do remember this conversation and I, I appreciate PD so much, but I guess my question is, and I think I may know a little bit of the answer, but I know education changes constantly and we are in a very interesting place right now, but what has changed with how we deliver professional development? Why can't we do it in the summertime? So yes, I guess I'm trying to understand how has it changed in the way we deliver it and why do we need to take the kids out of the classroom? Yeah, no, great question, Elena. And this, the thought behind this actually isn't related to the, the typical training that you might have. So for example, we have many teachers that, that give up their afternoons attending a math course. You know, from I think it's like 3.30 to 5.30, 6 o'clock at night that are outside of the school day. But one of, the, one of the needs that we have, you, you've heard us talk about our assessment tools that are now, we now are able to be able to look at how students are doing in the area of mathematics and ELA um, and be able to say, okay, these students may be at risk, these students uh, may need a challenge, and to pull teachers together, look at that data and say, okay, how are we collectively going to respond to that? So you want to be able to do that in the school year, not in the summer, because then, then you, you can't go back and take an action step. The, the other piece of that is that there are, there are times that, you know, I'll give an example, we pulled 
our math our math department together at the middle school high school to look at alignment across all of our math courses where standards were being covered and we needed all the teachers there to be able to do that and in the summer you know depending on people's schedules some people may be able to make it some people may not be able to make it so by having some time within the school year where we can engage in these professional activities that would not be considered, I would, I would argue that certainly teachers are learning and it's a part of professional development, but it's not the kind of typical training that you might get. It's engaging in data, it's engaging in curriculum work, and it, it's ensuring that all teachers have a voice in it, because if we do that outside of the contractual time, we, we're not able to have all teachers engaged. Do I get one more follow-up? Oh, no. I think she's still in two minutes. Sure. You. <laughs> yeah. So I thank you. I, I do see the, the value in that, especially real time feedback. Um, we used to do it during staff meetings. Um, does that still happen during staff meetings? So when you when you're kind of unpacking the data mm -hmm. and the staff meetings are about an hour, and what we know is that that is not enough time to, to really dig in and do this work. Um, we, and that there, I, I would share that, and I, we have Garen here, that in terms of staff meetings, they are, they are booked with other things as well. Um, so it, it, that is something that has, has been somewhat of a challenge to be able to figure out where to put it in. Um, yeah. Lou? Are you done, I don't know. <laughs> 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 I'm like, I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> I see my time. To <laughs> I think so. I okay. yes. Um, so, so there's two things that, that, that I would want to bring up. Number one, uh, I seem to remember we had a point earlier in the year, um, talking to our math team, that we had what 22 teachers that had gone off this summer and done professional development on their own out of our math team. Is that is that the right number, Garrett? Yeah. Okay. I mean, so we do have you know some extraordinarily committed teachers. I mean, that are trying to find time, and you know, on their own making themselves better teachers, learning the skills that go with it, that sort of a thing. So remember, we congratulated that group, and you know we should appreciate that a great deal. At the same time, we've made important investments in systems that support teachers. I mean, what we've done with the STAR assessment system, I mean, we've made a big investment in that, and we need to maximize that as much as possible. And we make big investments in our teachers. And I think the way that we maximize it is by this ongoing training. You can't just stick it all at the front of the year, because it's like everything else we do. You know, you go there for three days, two weeks later, you're like, boy, what did I learn there, right? Maybe some of it sticks, maybe some of it doesn't. But over the course of the year, if you can actually bring those teachers together and you can go through this data and take the investment that we made in curriculum leads and have them not only give feedback on students, but give feedback to teachers on teaching practices, we change the nature of this school. That is what really great schools are doing. I'd say we've got to find time for these four days. And I know it can be challenging for some families and we should make accommodations there, whether it's after school programming or Patty, your idea, like alternative programming, whatever it is. But not having these kinds of days, it pretty much handicaps what we're going to do relative to training our teachers. It puts real limitations on it. We as a board, I think, need to be willing to make that kind of an investment. I'm done. Second. Okay, anybody else like to speak? I mean, this is not unusual. I mean, these kinds of arrangements and days are, are pretty common across school districts and schools. Does it, how does it work with the required number of days of school. I mean, to Patty's point, um, does this still keep us well within that range? Yeah, it keeps you, as long as you serve lunch, it can be counted as a full day. Um, so it's much like if you think about when we have a delayed opening and we come in two hours later, that day still counts as one of the 175 days. Um, and, and what we're, we're finding right now is, and I appreciate and I agree, I want teachers in front of school kids as much as we possibly can. Um, but without this kind of time, then what we have to do is pull the teachers out of class, and then we're putting a substitute in front of them. And um, you know, we know that that's not the same as having a teacher there. So that's, that's part of the trade-off that we're trying to work through. Um, you know, this is something that our, our faculty continues to ask for, is, is more of this kind of collaborative time and again, the, the leadership team um, also is supportive of having this additional time um, in order to have the quality of what's happening in the classroom 
um, can, you know, continue to, to improve. As, as teachers have more time to collaborate, they, they, folks learn from one another, and we can take you know, really good work that's happening into, in classrooms and just bring it up to the next level when people have an opportunity to work together on some of these critical issues. So is it about eight, eight hours of instruction, roughly? Uh, if it in, get through lunch. Yeah, yeah so I, you know, I would anticipate it would probably be about two hours. That you, much like if you have a delayed opening and you have the two hours at the end of the day, this, at the beginning of the day, this would be two hours at the end of the day. And if this is, if this is something that um, the board would like to move forward with, we would come back with you for lots, uh, with more details. I understand that there are detailed questions associated with this. Um, but right now, this is conceptual. We're trying to solve a problem um, in terms of the amount of time that we need to pull teachers so that they can work on, the, on um, critical areas um, and, not, and also deal with the challenges that we're having related to substitute. I'm wondering how many weeks winter workshops are. I mean, is that something where we have two or three fewer day Fridays of winter workshops so that we keep kids in front of the teacher for those amount of time and then we still have these quarterly half days? Does that make sense? Yeah, one of, the, one of the things that we're finding with those winter workshops is that there is a demand for our teachers to get kids to different places. No, I don't mean on the same day, I guess I'm saying instead of having eight weeks of winter workshops, like if we're worried about taking kids out of class time, we already are doing that a lot for the right. winter workshops. So do you have, instead of eight weeks of winter workshops, you have five weeks of winter workshops, mm -hmm. and then you still have these half? That, that would certainly help with that. What is winter workshop? So ski, it's ski, like ski runners. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Patty, did you want to? Um, and there are, just, just so I make sure that I'm seeing this, okay, there are six other in-service days on this calendar, correct, on top, and then there's those other the four. So there are, there are three days at the beginning of school, um, and then there are two days during the course of the school year, and then one the day after school gets out. So there's <coughs> two full days. Two so days yeah, during the school so year. So the answer, the short answer is yes, there are, that's how they fall over the course of the calendar. And, and what do you do in those six days versus what would you do in these four half days? Yeah. Like yeah. differentiate the, the two professional developments that you're asking. Sure, so in terms of the, the start of the school day, there is the initial day where we pull everybody in the district together. Um, we talk about kind of the vision for the year, that, that chart that you saw in terms of critical areas of focus. We, we're, we're going over things like that. Um, then, you know, the high school may engage in some school specific um, initiative or learning. Um, and the elementary schools may pull together and talk about something that's happening right at the elementary school um, <coughs> where we have all the staff together. The other two days are building base. There are a lot of what I would call compliance trainings that need to occur during those times. So those are happening at schools. Uh, teachers are getting their rooms ready to go. Um, and so that happens over those two, uh, two days. They, those tend to be in school days where schools are coming together as communities. Um, the October in-service this year um, if you remember, we had Dave Melnick in. We had the entire faculty being trained on tra trauma-informed practices aligned with our strategic goal related to social-emotional learning. Um, and then in, in March, we are pulling all of our teachers together. We have some teacher-led workshops um, that teachers are going to learn from one another. Um, they're going to share their action research that they've been engaged in as they study um, different aspects of their, their, their teaching and their impact on kids. Um, we, have all, we have all of our teachers engaged in some sort of an action research project. They're going to share that with one another um, at the March date. And then the last day at the end of the school is to kind of pack up and um, get prepared for the summer and finish out paperwork. Can I? Versus. Oh, versus. And I'm versus sorry. So, versus. So, yeah. these are the 
things that happen intermediately over the course of the year. So you have a data collection. For example, Lou, you mentioned the STAR data. So we, we are assessing students. Now we have this data. So that's a time-sensitive meeting that needs to happen. We need about a half a day for it. Um, and we pull people together to look at that data, um, both collectively as a grade level where, you know, what, what do all of our kids seem to be struggling with? What do my kids seem to be struggling with in my classroom? Making plans and adjusting instruction and curriculum as need be. Um, so that, that happens um, in the fall and again in the winter months after the, ass the assessment pieces. Um, so that's, that's, that's something different that happens in the more training type of experiences. And then the other piece is curriculum work itself, right? Um, one of the things that we've continued to talk about, we'll talk about again this evening in terms of the, the budget, is the need to get um, aligned curriculum that everybody agrees on. Um, and we have a lot of work to be done in that area. And so this allows teachers to come together as a team and work on um, their curriculum so that we have clarity around that across the district. Can I have my second? Yes. Can I have my first? first yes. <laughs> Not against okay. his first. first. Um, I guess I would, as a parent of two kids, um, I have limited ETO, and I know there's plenty of families around the community. You know, we got to factor in variables like if we have a big winter season, right? And that's snow days, that's time off. We're also talking about, you know, for ski runners or winter workshop, the schools are always asking for parent volunteers. So that's time that parents are taking off from work to come help. Um, I encourage, and I like, I want to support all of what you're saying, but I guess I would encourage administration of get creative about how to limit the impact it's putting on families. Yeah, we have, what, we, what we've been able to do is to right. get subs to pull people in. Right. What we're saying is that we're, we're not loving that as a solution. Um, yeah, and I, I guess I just respectfully yeah. kind of push back and say, you guys got to get more creative because you're putting it back on families that don't have resources oftentimes. And you factor in, you get a lot of snow days, you get sick kids, and people are burning through their ETO, and it just puts them at a, you know, it puts them at a, a, a handicap. You can have your second. Anybody else wants to make a first comment? Um, I think my biggest comment is I understand both sides of the coin and and I think we have to be cognizant of both sides and how we could creatively achieve what Mary Beth is seeing as a need within the schools within with our teachers but also be cognizant of the pressure that it puts on working families, you know, who don't have that luxury of being able to come and pick their children up on these half days. However, I will say historically that we have had this kind of data at our fingertips for many, many years, and teachers have not been willing to look at this data. Um, and I think we're finally at a point where our staff is really open towards talking about the data and how they can improve within their own classrooms so that our test scores and our student outcomes continually grow in a positive manner versus a negative sense. So I, I think we shouldn't overlook this conversation but try to find a, Kind of a happy balance on both sides. Yeah. Just a, a clarification, and I, I would say that it really isn't so much that teachers weren't willing to do this. Um, I think it's a question of having structures in place that enable you to do this, right? So if you don't have structures built in, it's not a question of, a, I, I think, a willingness as a when do we do that? Like, when can we actually pull everybody together to do it? But I, I you know, I what I would echo there is that teachers are very invested in looking at student outcomes and you know are interested in collaborating with their colleagues to figure out how to best do that. Pamela, I think everyone's yeah, um, this this is probably not a comment directed towards the solution for right now, but but looking forward it, it seems like the um, the solution may be in 
connecting this conversation to negotiations and the contract because um, you know I, I'm a teacher I'm in a union I and I have a contract and we do PD we do it all on a sort of incentivized basis for our annual activity report so that we meet you know we have to do a certain number of things in order to meet <coughs> expectations so that gives us flexibility to do it it also benefits us we do it um, you know there are creative ways to to help people find the time in flexible ways and also you know to, to try to manage this kind of thing so obviously this this looking at our contract and all of the issues is a much bigger puzzle um, so what I have to say has no value for this immediate thing <laughs> but I think it's something to think about for the future <laughs> Just wondering if you couldn't, um, if you want, if this is important to prioritize, you have two existing days, right, during the, during the school year, in service days, mm -hmm. correct? What if you added, I mean, just from the stand, standpoint of parents, I know this is a, you know, PTO or time off issue, um, wouldn't you almost be better off generating this kind of conversation in a full day rather than four half days? Mm -hmm. So if we didn't go the full measure, but we added one more in service day, and you looked at three in service days, to accomplish this priorita you know, prioritization around data, whatever the project is, and you've got three days during the school year to be able to carry on that conversation. Then at least parents can prepare uh, for an additional day, which may in and of itself be a burden, but it, it's better than sometimes getting hung up on a half day, because the, the, you know, the logistics around that can be worse than preparing for, okay, I've got, to, I've got to cover this full day, and I know I've got three in the year, and I know what days they're on. That can be more helpful than perhaps a half day. And it may be better from your end, too, in terms of generating the kind of conversation. By the time you get post-lunch to 5 o'clock, I don't know how late you go. So, you know, what you can get done in a half day versus a full day. I will say one last thing. I think I sent uh, everyone on the board an article a while ago. I forget how long ago. It's called Inside the Black Box, Raising Standards to Classroom Assessment. Basically talking about this exact thing, you know, using uh, formative data in the classroom and everything we need to do around it to make that be effective. It is the number one impact on moving the needle in student achievement. I mean, it's not even a close second, quite frankly. So this is something, no matter how we have to get creative, what we have to do, that we, I think we absolutely have to make the investment in and figure out. So hopefully we can get to that point. Lou, can you send that out again? I can send this out again. I think Ray has his hand. I just wanted to go with Adam and say, it doesn't actually have to be maybe always on a Friday. So if someone had a Friday shift, you're you're pretty much hosing everyone who has Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> so what you could do is spread it around a little bit. I agree with yeah. the educating and Lou's idea. I think that's fine, but I don't know why it would have to be for always Fridays. Friday. So perhaps you could get more creative just with the day. <laughs> Yeah, the, the thought That's there was possible. that it would help yeah. families if they were going away for a weekend or something like I that. But that was that certainly Fridays very very flexible in terms day. of yeah. yeah. Jim, I, I guess I'm lost because teachers are salaried and staff are all salaried, okay, and it, it, I'm not on the negotiations team, and probably won't say thank God, but. Um, <laughs> You know, when we say that the staff is going above and beyond, a salaried person is supposed to put in more time than just the, the regular work week. And, you know, my wife is a uh, controller, CPA, and, you know, sometimes she has to take an extra class to keep up, and she'll say, kids, dad, I'm not going to be home till 8 o'clock tonight because after five o'clock, I got to run down to Rutland. I got to take this class from six o'clock to eight o'clock to keep up on my to keep up on my work. I think what you're hearing here is is that nobody is against. We, we all want to see the the staff up to the top notch. It's just how do we get there? And 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 to me, it comes back to a salary person is a salary person, and and they understand that there are other requirements and just in the classroom in this case or in an office for others um, you, you need to find time either after school you need to find time on a weekend my wife goes to many training classes on weekends and um, I just think it's a really big thing of 
telling, let's say, my daughter, she's got to come to school on Friday morning and she has study hall first period. But we got to have to make sure we get your lunch because then we could count it as a full day. So your first hour and 10 minutes or your first hour and 20 minutes from 8 o'clock to 9.30, whatever, you're going to be in a study hall. And then 9.30 to, I don't know, a quarter to 11, you got one more class. But we got to make sure we feed you so we can count you. It, that, doesn't, that doesn't sit well with me. I think salaried people are salaried people. Find it outside of classroom time. Thank you, Jim. I would ask Paige or Patty to comment. Um, there's an hour of the day limit. Could I say that? Yeah. In the contract. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a, an hour what? There's an, how many hours of the day they can they are they have they can be detained. And I said I don't. And know I, and, I, and, I would, and I wrote this down because I didn't think I'd get another chance to say anything. And I wanted him to oh, take another chance. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say you know I think honestly and again I come from you know and I'm, I'm a retired veterinarian you know my employees were salaried employees and I paid for their continuing education but they found time to do it. I, 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 Lou, I really respect, I can't, I can't talk to people, this really bothers me, I'm sorry. I, that red-headed guy over there, I really respect him <laughs> and I know he, he it, it right. comes from um, an area of understanding that I don't have. I would think I, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to speak for myself from the negotiation standpoint. This is one of the most infuriating parts of this whole thing for me. I think if this means something to them, they'll show up, they'll show up. Let's, let's see how much it means to anybody and have them, have them like, yeah, I'm going to teach those kids for those two days, but you know what, I'm also going to stay for that three or four, two hours here, three, three hours here, four hours there to go over this data because it means that much to me. And, you know, put their money where their mouth is. I, I just, I, I, I just feel really strongly about that. I think, I think we should expect all of it to happen, and I think it doesn't always have to come on the back of the kids and the parents. Let's, you know, we, you know, we all have to carry a bit of that, and that's going to be the staff as well, in my opinion. Thank you, Pam. <coughs> Is there anybody else who wanted to say anything on this issue? I, I guess I just want to say um, in response, but not to Patty, um, in response to, to, to Patty's comments, I mean, I, I, that's why I'm saying that I think talking about this in relationship to what can the teachers give, what can the teachers offer, is a future conversation because we don't, we're not going to disrespect or violate their contract, obviously, but maybe there is a conversation to be had about compromise in that area. Thank you. I, um, yes. I think that there's also a bigger conversation on when we use the word professional development. And there is contractual professional development, there's non-contractual professional development, and is a working lunch to go over formative data something that should be required or something that should be an invitation. So I think it is a much bigger conversation. Yes, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yes. Just very, very quickly, one is that I, I want to share how many of our teachers are, are extending themselves beyond the school year day. We've talked about math courses, that we have very, very high enrollment. So we have the trauma-informed practice. What do we have to about 20, 20 professionals that are giving up time during a February vacation and other days to attend this. Um, you know, and one of the things just to be mindful of, you look at an elementary teacher, for example, they need to be well-versed and skilled in the teaching of writing. They need to be well-versed and skilled in the teaching of reading. They need to be well-versed and skilled in the teaching of social studies, in science. They need to understand trauma-informed practices. They math. Need to, uh, math. Math. <laughs> math. Absolutely math. <laughs> yeah, as yeah, I'm going, I'm so <laughs> that they're, you know, that, and I, and I absolutely hear the challenges as a, as a working parent myself. I get it that this can be really challenging in terms of trying to manage this. The, and this is a balanced question, right? And there's, you know, there's no perfect answer to it. But what, what we're trying to propose is when we do these things, we, knew that we know that the quality of instruction improves in the classroom. 
And where is the balance in terms of investing in these types of activities so that the face time that teachers have is at the absolutely highest level? And where is when they're out of the classroom a detriment? And that, that's the balance we're trying to strike. We bring you our best recommendations. We understand that you look at it through a different lens than we do, right? We're looking at how do you get to the absolute highest level of best practice. You're looking, you know, and, and as, as you should, as a, a parent and community member, what does this mean for families and that type of thing? So I think that it's a balance, you know, and again, there's no perfect answer, um, but that, that's, that's the reason we're bringing you these things. Um, and I, I do think that we have teachers that work very hard, that work beyond the contractual day. Um, many, many, many times, uh, part of the challenge often is, is that one teacher may be able to work beyond the contractual day on Tuesday, and one teacher may be able to work beyond the contractual day on Thursday, or one might be able to come in early in the morning, and one might be able to come later in the afternoon. And when you meet them all together in the room, that's where it can just sometimes get tricky. But I, you know, I, I certainly hear the concerns, um, and you know, again, it's a balance that, that I'm sure we'll be able to figure out. Uh, does anyone want to make any further comments? Next, uh, motion for a five-minute recess before, as we transition to the next topic. Sure. What? Be, uh, yeah. Let's uh, before we get Second. to the budget. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we do this on this issue? Um, Let's, let's ask Mary Beth, and, and Paige and I will we'll meet with Mary Beth. It won't be before next week's meeting, but before our Jan, you know, at one of our January meetings, let um, the three of us take a deeper look at this and see if, um, you know, see if, if there's some sort of compromise. This is a first, a first look at issues that, you know, we really have talked about putting things on people's radar screens earlier so that you could digest it before we vote on anything. And so let's, um, let's the three of us take a look at it for January, okay, and see what, what else we can come up with, okay? So yes, let's do a five minute break before we get to expenses. Okay, let's start up again. Okay, um, expense budget. So, everybody has page. Uh, who page is it? Um, let's get page 24 in front of us, please. Um, so, this is like we said, you know, these are first looks at everything. Um, it's not the finance committee's first look, but it's, you know, it starts to be. Um, you know, we're giving you some considerations. Um, Mike, can, Mike can answer our questions, but um, we, this is the expense side of it. We don't have the revenue side yet, um, which, which really um, shows us what the tax implications are going to be. But as we, have dis as we have been discussing for, I'd say, at least a month or two, our our, the increase in our contractual obligations is pretty significant this year, obviously. Um, the health insurance is at the bottom. The um, compensation is up at the top. Um, we have broken it out, the MUD, the WCSU, and Barnard Academy, since Barnard's, um, uh, well, we'll see tomorrow. Not in the MUD right now, but um, fingers crossed for tomorrow. So um, considerations, uh, when Mike put this together, uh, you remember that last year, and those of you who are new to the board uh, will, might remember um, us, us uh, mentioning that we had um, in place some early retirements last year. Um, those early retirement packages were a three-year package, so last year was year one, or the year we're in now budget was year one. This budget we're talking about right now is year two, and then there will be a third year. Where's Mike? I'm like looking for him for like a shake head. Okay. Um, so that's taken into account. <clears throat> The contractual increases, um, we're, we're sort of saying it's about a, an average of, of uh, 3.5%. Some people, you know, it, it's the work that the negotiations team did to get everybody into this, um, you know, the right steps where they're supposed to be. Um, you know, our salary grid has two parts to it. It's the number of years you've, you've taught and then your amount of education. And um, so sort of to get everybody lined up, and we had very different pay schedules 
um, on the various campuses, so those were, were combined. Um, so, you know, there is, there is, there are some people that are going to see much bigger increases than three and a half percent, and there will be some people who will see no tax, or no um, uh, salary increase. Um, a, I want to explain what 26 lane change applications means in order to, um, if you have, have received further education or are finishing up and getting to, you had a, you had a mass, you had a um, bachelor's plus 15, now you're going to have a bachelor's plus 30, you have to make an application to the central office and to Mike explaining, you know, that you've done this so that um, we can budget for this. So there were 26 lane changes in this year, which is great news for our district. It means that teachers have invested in their education and um, because although we do um, give something, we don't give enough to get a lane, you know, so the teachers are paying for this on their own. So um, that's, that's great news. Our teachers are, are investing in their education. Um, but it does mean that we have to account for that. Uh, corrected stepped entries. There was some cleanup work that was required um, of Mike's department in this, uh, in this manner, so getting everybody where they're supposed to be. Um, additionally, in this year's budget, the FY20 substitutes, um, now, now are they being moved for next year out of regular comp into a line so item with Kelly? Part, so last year they were in the, they were in the comps. They were in the compensation. FY twenty, even That's though we were paying Kelly services. Well, I don't think Kelly started until this fiscal year. This fiscal, okay. But this is twenty. They were right now. We have Kelly. I think I, these. What I'm seeing is the substitute lines were in uh, a compensation budgeted line. The actuals are going to flow through. Are going to actually throw through a separate line. So the but the budget's there for fiscal year twenty. All I'm saying is. When we compare fiscal year 20 to 21, yeah. it's hard to compare because substitutes are in the compensation line, that's all, and we're going to take them out and put them where they're going right now. Gotcha. What's, the, what's the total amount ballpark on substitutes? Great question. I'm actually still working on that. So. Okay. Mike? Yep. There's a, in the compensation section, there's a $528,000 total. What do we normally spend on? Um, Substitutes. That's, that's, that's the question there, and that's the apples and apples well, that you I'd can't. Like, I'd like to have that information so that I can work with Larry to make a recommendation that is it more cost effective, just looking at it financially, to have two full time substitutes, or should we keep using Kelly Services? And I can't give you a good answer yet, but I will. And when we do, we can make that decision more intelligently as a board. Um. So you know that's something to consider in the in the compensation part of the um, graph here. And then uh, below we have the health care. You know we've been <coughs> warning of um, of the impending 12.9 percent increase. Um, you'll note, and I'm sure you'll say what we did in the finance committee. I don't understand the variation <laughs> for the mud is 30 percent. WCSU is down seven and Barnard's down two, so how does that even make any sense? It seems as if maybe you can, it, people weren't slotted uh, probably appropriately. I mean, is, is that yeah, what's going on? Yeah, there's of cleanup effort. We had to, we had to, I really scrubbed. I learned a lot, guys. I learned a lot over the last few weeks, you know, going through these, these compensation models, which you would think, how complicated can a compensation model be? Well, come on over and I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys see if you, if, if you guys need some insomnia cures. So where I'm going with this is, is that, Great cleanup effort. We had a lot of puts and takes based on where people were, what health care options that they elected. Okay, the numbers actually got better. So I spent the entire day with Linda. I think I worked her so hard she fell down and hurt her knee again. So that's really not good. But oh, that, no. that said, no, she's okay. She's, <laughs> she did fall. It, 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 she re-injured it. But anyway, she's going to go see her uh, therapist tomorrow to get it, get it worked on. Okay, this number is actually a lot better. This 470 uh, is actually down to 429. So so Yay. there's a lot further scrubbing. So what does that mean? It means, it really means that our health care increase is very much in line with what the state mandate was, which is that 12.9 percent increase across the board. The difference in that 1.3, I know to be about a dozen employees that had a lot of different life-changing events. When you have a life-changing event, guess what? You choose a different health care option, right? You have children or you get married, whatever it is, okay? Um, 
So the point is, we're about 14.2% over last year. So this is all what in line. What did you line. say, 14.2? In totality right now, yep. And it, we've scrubbed it. Every employee has been scrubbed on uh, where they are on the grid, stepwise, what their education is. And just to be clarify what Jennifer was mentioning earlier, those 26 lane changes are anticipated lane changes effective July 1st. Not right now, where they think they're going to be to provide the documentation to get them to that lane change we've effectively recorded it. Now, the good news is if we go in with this mindset, if they're late in any way, that's actually a little bit of an advantage in the budget. Meaning if they don't get the documentation to us by November, in theory, four or five months, we're at the lower rate. I'm just giving you guys examples. This does happen because we modeled it last year this way and sometimes the documentation takes time to come in. The budget's built appropriately. The actual is just lagging. That's the difference. Yeah. So um, you're saying that the totals have shifted a little bit since this was printed, then you must be saying that the the, the percentages are wrong, and are we going to see that at our next meeting, see this updated chart, basically? If I could respond to that, this, as you know, is happening in real time. We met Friday morning, yep. um, and Mike went and spent the day with their, his team on Friday and today in between the auditors and all that kind of stuff. So that these are the latest numbers after working that through Friday. Um, so this, this needs to get in the board book. So when we meet again on Friday morning, we'll have the, the very latest numbers. As a reminder, this is a process, right? Um, and it's going to continue to evolve. Um, it's, but what we, we wanted to do at this point is to show you that there are some fairly significant increases related to comp and benefit. Um, that we want the board to be aware of as we, we move forward. Each, each meeting from here on out, you're going to be getting additional information as things clarify. We're, you know, we'll be getting information from the state. But, but you're right that, that this was printed right after the FinCon meeting on Friday morning, right? And then the day was spent on Friday even going further. So you are going to see some discrepancies. I think the, the bigger message here is that we're seeing some fairly large increases in both comp and bed. Yeah. So I just want to follow up. I wasn't, there was no implied criticism in my question. I was literally asking, are we going to see this chart updated at our next meeting? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank yeah. you. And I think, you know, just to sort of give people a heads up, it's, it's um, nothing's definite yet, but I certainly think the finance committee um, is committed to having really accurate, up-to-date information before we bring anything to voters. And um, we, you know, we, Mike is working really hard on this, but we don't have everything that we need um, right now. We really don't. So we will, this is a work in progress, but um, I certainly think uh, the Finance Committee will be open if we are not able, I mean, this hasn't happened to me before, but it, but I think we haven't had as, as accurate numbers as we've, as we've got, as we're working with now. And, and if we're not ready to bring, you know, if we haven't been able, if Mike's department hasn't really been able to figure out a game plan for closing out FY19, um, you know, I think that if we need to, to push this budget vote later than March, we will <coughs> certainly suggest that um, because we need, we, we have to have the real numbers, you know, and, um, and we need uh, 19 to be closed in order to do that. Yes, Paige. <laughs> <laughs> we also just FYI talked in our last meeting about um, previous presentations of budgets and them being quite overwhelming in the amount of information that had been given at each sit down as a full board and that Jennifer and I really wanted to focus on giving you really accurate numbers and information on smaller pieces in each board meeting. Um, and as we said, the numbers are, are moving on a day-to-day -day basis, but it was important for you to see the first piece that we're looking at because it does affect our budget and the numbers and how it's going to affect our taxpayers, which is this compensation and health care. Compensation and health care make up about 70% of our total budget. Um, so it's a really big topic for us to look at. It's also really crucial that we have the numbers correct. Um, 
So it's this was the first task that we wanted to start showing and sharing with you as a finance committee. Um, I'm gonna just if you go to page 25 now, um, you notice just up at the top there's some there's some assumptions. I want to go through those with people. Uh, first of all, there was you know the the mentioned the, the frequently mentioned 12.9 percent increase in health care. Um, 70% HRA load factor, just as a, um, just to walk this back a bit to remind people what this is. We, we fully fund HRAs for our employees. <coughs> or, oh, 90%, 90%, it hasn't changed. Okay. Um, we, uh, uh, employees do not typically, you know, we're now at probably year know, six of an HRA, seven. Maybe six or seven, seven you know, something whole. like that. But, but um, you know, in the beginning when you're setting up an HRA, you might fund it, um, you know, closer to 100% uh, in case everybody used every bit of it. You know, data shows people usually come in in the 60 to 65% range. 70 is, is a nice, you know, now we've gotten, we have enough data and have, remember, the HRA sits with the district. And so, um, you know, that pot, the pot of remaining money that is, goes unused grows each year. Um, you certainly want to fund it enough so that should people go above the sort of national or state average, you'd have that cushion. But we funded it at 70%, which, um, you know, seems to be quite reasonable. So that's, a, that's what that means. Additional assumptions, when, we, when you look at these comp numbers, um, there is the shift um, in curriculum coordination, which is presently a position at the middle and high school only. It will be, it would be that same position, but we're expanding the role to now be kindergarten through 12. So the, the <coughs> curriculum coordinator will, will do curriculum coordination of the elementary school and the high school. It's a single position, but the um, responsibilities um, have increased and, uh, and so there is a, there is an appropriate um, uh, increase there. And that we'll show that more specifically at the next meeting. All these are factored into the assumption or into the comp. Um, there was also there was money for a point two elementary curriculum coordinator. That has been eliminated. Um, director of buildings and grounds, there's been a market adjustment really to look at what that what that um, position was hired in at and then looking at buildings and grounds um, people around the state and sort of getting ours in the middle of that range. Um, enrollment adjustments have led to um, a couple of, of positions. Um, there was really quite frankly like an it was really just an oversight last year on reading the guide. You know guidance and nursing really are usually dictated pretty much um, according to the number of students, you know, and uh, last year, the or for this year, the guidance counselor was kept in two days a week at Reading, but that's, that was an oversight because based on the number of students, um, that that's uh, it's too much staffing. Um, we have a, a projected enrollment at, at Killington next year of 131, um, and so that necessitates a couple things. Um, there is a reading specialist who's going to retire. We're not going to backfill that, but we are going to move. We've had a nurse uh, three mornings a week, and with 131 kids, um, there's not enough coverage uh, for the nurse. Additionally, uh, for the guidance, uh, those two those two figures, those two um, positions will be increased. Um, and that's really just like I said. That's that's pretty much based on you base nursing guidance on number of kids. Uh, Pamela, um, I just I I guess. I don't know if this is pedantic, but I don't think so. Um, some of these things don't definitely do make sense as assumptions um, based on the staffing at Killington, et cetera. But some of them seem like they aren't really assumptions. They're board votes. Well, uh, they are assumptions in putting together this number. Okay, mm -hmm. we are we haven't voted on this number whether this is a number that we're comfortable with. We're letting you know what's in that number right now. When we put that together. These things were assumed. I don't think anything is assumed. Everything's on the table for the board to vote on. We'll be voting on every on this budget. And we haven't voted on this budget. We're being very clear about what was assumed 
okay. when this number so, was put so together. So then, just follow up is yep. that um, if if a board member wished to have discussion about any of those, yeah. the time would be later, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think next month, next, it, it might be next week, it yeah. might be in one week. Um, yeah, no, there will be discussion and we'll have, we'll have numbers associated with these, but this is, a, this is to let you know, these are what is in here. There's nothing hiding that's in here. These were the assumptions made. But everything's up, I mean, we, we're going to vote on that budget. Everybody needs to be very clear about what's in that budget and be comfortable with it. Thank you. I think it's one of the things we had asked for last time we went through this process, like show us what's changing. So I think that's primarily what it is. Right? Yep. So. Okay. Um, maybe could, um, are, there are there some more questions on the assumptions in the comp numbers? John, I don't have questions yet. It's the yeah. same thing I'm going to bring up. We're making this sound like this is the only increases, but it, it, it's not. There's more to this, so I don't see. We're not going to have a vote on the budget next month, next no. meeting. No. Okay, you know, just if everybody flipped to page five, not five. Hold on a second. Need a letter from the state or whatever. Oh, page, yeah. page nine. You know, for those that don't, 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 don't understand. I don't understand, but those aren't familiar Don't with how the, bu that. how the budget works. We have um, our cost per student in this current year is 19,700, no, 17,944. We had um, $15 million actually line uh, budget that we were doing. So if you divide that by the 17,944, you have 835, call it 836 pupils. That's the per pupil spending. So we have $15 million that we're first starting off with, and you take this million dollars here right now that you're adding in for 957000 or whatever we want to be correct, um, for health and for benefits and the assumptions, you know, you're adding $957,000 to that. I call it $16 million. And that's not doing anything else at this point. So if you take that 16 million and you divide it by the 836, 836 um, children that we have in here, you're at $19,138 per pupil already. Last year, or this current year, I think our per pupil excess spending was at $18,000, I think we were just under it. Yeah. They usually raise that around $750, $800 per year or whatever. So we're going to be 130. We're going to be like $300 into the per pupil spending excess. So if we add $350 to that, you got 19,500 bucks. And then you go to the page here where it tells you to divide by the 10,883. 19,500 divided by the 10,883. We're starting at $1.79 right off the bat is the tax rate. Yes, we take four cents off because we joined the mud, well, some of us did, and uh, we take four <coughs> cents off. Jeez, you know, okay. And uh, so we're at $1.75. With, with the six cents off this current year, we were at $1.62. 69. 69. No, with the six cents off, we were at $1.62. We were at a tax rate of a dollar sixty-nine, and then the state gave us the six cents off. We were at a dollar sixty-two after I subtracted the four cents for this year coming in from a dollar seventy-nine to a dollar seventy-five. So, you know, we're we're already seeing um, from a dollar. If you want to say a dollar sixty-nine, so one point six nine without any of the benefits divided by the one point seven nine. We're already looking at a six and a half percent increase, which is above the five and a half percent that's in this letter here. Yeah. We're not going further anymore. But we go further into this conversation back into the budget where after the assumptions, and this has nothing to do, Bob and Patty, about it, it's, it's, it's nothing to do about Pomfret, okay? This is really me just looking at a budget wise. But there's the talking about um, the HVAC system over at the over at the at the at the school 
And if the HVAC system is going to cost $108,000 for running it and installing it, that $108,000 divided by the 836 students is adding another $129 per pupil, which you're already in the excess spending, so you got to do that too, so you're $258. So $258 divided by the 10883 is another two and almost two and a half cent increase. Now we don't know by putting that system into Pomfret, you know, what is the actual process and thought of what we're doing with that school? Yes. And, 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 and I'm asking this because if we're going to open the school as a K through six, I think we should know that. Let's make a point of order. Is this a discussion of the budget? It's a, it's, it's a, well, we're having a discussion. Just no, I don't, I don't mind talking about the HVAC system, but um, is this, is this, are we, are we in that, well, in this place in time to get into this much depth? Like, I guess mean, my point of order question. I think sitting on the, fi I think, on the finance committee. A point of I order. I think basically sitting on the finance committee that, you know, yeah. I'm being nice yeah. here. So, you know, I kind of hate this bit about Robert's rules that when well, somebody wants to say yeah. point of order, no, excuse me, I got my 10 minutes. Want to say point of two. order? Two. 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 No, it's ten minutes with Robert's rules. It is ten minutes. Yeah. So when someone wants we, to question me we, and not supposed to interrupt me, but wants to say point of order, you know, this is a finance. I do not interrupt your conversations when you're talking about your hypothetical new building. Jeff, look at me. Thank you. Thank you. I asked you if you could, if everybody could please address me. That would so make it a little, Jim. I'm, I'm not even looking at anyone. I'm looking down at my piece of paper, Jennifer. Okay. Do you, have a, do you have a further comment? You will have a second chance to speak. What we are doing is you can make it a little bit, you know, I mean, I, I, didn't, I was, didn't start timing you, Jim, so I don't know exactly how long you've been speaking. Thank you. I'll for, say I'm done for my first time. Then. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, we have now, what I'd like is to have Mary Beth go through um, the additional investment for consideration. These are some other things that have not been factored in to the um, these projections here, the health care or the compensation. So just to give us, we don't have numbers associated with these right now that we're presenting to you. It's to sort of give you an idea that these are some additional investment ideas. Um, you know, and we'll sort of see where we fall. As you can see this is this is preliminary. It does look like um, you know, as, as Jim was saying, I mean, it looks like we are, we're looking at a more significant tax increase than we've seen um, in past. Want, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I know Jim's not like the briefest person in the world, but I, I think there was a lot of value in, in what he was sharing with us, and, and I do want to hear more about it. I mean, this, this state increase is, we have to consider it as we move forward, so. I just wanted to yeah. say that. Which is why it was important that it was in the board book for everybody yes, to really absolutely. get a look well, at it. I appreciate um, that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and not to get too deep, does everybody here understand what the penalty phase means? Does, would anybody like a little primer on it? Do you, are you, just make, I just do you want, want to us to sure explain? So yeah, because you yes. know all of this goes right over my head, so. Well, no, I'm not looking at you for that yeah. reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, we, and I, and I think, I guess I can only speak for having, well, for having done the Killington budget, it's a black and white for me. I don't go in penalty phase, and I think most of us would feel, would feel that way. Any, any amount, um, above, you know, the state sets a certain amount it wants you to spend per pupil that they think it is appropriate. Um, it was somewhere in the 18, low 18s, I think, last year. Um, we, were, we were just below it, although it, well, you, you all will remember we had, I think, the middle and high school part of the budget was above it, but they allowed us to, um, you know, um, average it. Average it. And um, so, but certainly um, that is nowhere we want to be. You're paying, you know, our, our taxpayers and all of us are going to be paying double, you know, the taxes, anything above that, that penalty phase. So we, we won't have that number till January, until um, the state announces what that, um, what that number is, but certainly the way it's looking right now, I mean, we would we would be in that. So we need to um, we need to have that on the radar as something. I cert I'm personally real absolutely committed to not being in that penalty phase. So um, 
I don't think that's anything that we have we have passed this budget successfully for years. I don't think that's something our taxpayers are going to um, shoulder. So I think we need to be really cognizant of that. So that's a number that the state sets that we are on the lookout for and waiting for. And um, and what we don't have the the flip side of this budget is we don't have the uh, revenue part really um, at all yet to look at, and that's going to be. Uh, you know, that's that's the counter to this but I'd like to have um, and thank you Pamela I this is why we're starting this conversation now and it's going to be next week and it's going to be Jan whatever our first meeting is in January and the second meeting in January this is going to you know be continued discussion this is a first look for everybody which is what I had promised you I want Mary Beth to now talk about the additional investments for consideration sort of as we go forward and what some of the rationale behind these um, these investments might be Right, and so <coughs> these are things that, you know, I, I think particularly if, if numbers had looked a little bit different, we would go into more de detail, give you numbers in terms of costs. Um, but there are some additional things that, that I would put forth would be beneficial for the district. Um, one of the things that kind of ties into the conversation about PD in the summer and can we do those types of things during the summer. So giving coaches some additional summertime where they can actually be leading professional development is one of the ways that we can do that. So adding some summer days to their contract. Um, and would they offer professional development that teachers would then be able to go to? I mean, we wouldn't be paying the teachers to go to it, but we'd be paying these coaches to run it? Right. So one of the, one of the models that we're trying to use in terms of coaches is that we can send the coaches to a training, right, as opposed to every teacher in the district sending them out. The teachers become trained in that. The coaches become trained in it, and then they train the teachers, right? So as opposed to sending... 15 teachers out to, um, you know, an example this year would be a foundations training. Um, we sent two people out, and then those two people are teaching everybody else. Um, so the, the coaches are delivering professional development, um, and it's kind of a train-the-trainer model. Um, so that, that's one possibility that would increase our ability to get, a, you know, excellent training to teachers at a, at a lower cost. Um, Aligned with that is to give department chairs uh, um, some additional time during the summer to do some of this curriculum work. Um, and it's, so when you look at a K-12 curriculum director, you know, you, there is no director that knows all, all curriculum for all subjects. So they rely on department chairs to help them in terms of designing and, and developing curriculum. So currently our department chairs, um, their, their stipend had been cut, their amount of responsibilities that they had were pushed back in relation to that. So one of the things that we can look at is to increase some of the time that <coughs> department chairs have in, in terms of their responsibility. And then looking at a question of you know, um, areas that haven't had representation. So if we look at things like the visual and performing arts, um, do, do, we, do we want to have K-12 curriculum alignment there um, where we have our, um, a director that's looking at that across the district? Um, another example would be kind of health and wellness would be another one. So looking at the department chair model and, and bumping up stipends around that to give us more capacity. Um, we have some functions in the district that are, are not currently allocated as we went through the org chart. <coughs> and so we're looking at could we, instead of trying to bring someone in to do some of these functions, um, add additional responsibilities to some of our central office staff and um, give them some small level of compensation for that additional responsibility. So currently we do not have anybody that is dedicated to transportation, right, um, in terms of pre-K. And in terms, one of the things that we are attempting to do, and I, and I believe we are going to be ready to do it this fall, is to centralize registration so that instead of having administrative assistance in each of the buildings um, do registration, um, it would all come to one place because <coughs> part of the number problem that we have is when people do not do the registrations 
in a standardized way. Um, and the other thing that this central registration will also do is um, help with kind of some digital entry of materials that parents can update. So that, that again, is a, would be a relatively small amount of money, but looking at something like that. I have had a request from Marsha Bender um, for a theater tech director. That position is currently grant funded this year. Again, it's a, a relatively small amount of money, but that's something that has been um, brought to my attention and I would be supportive of that. It's, again, small amount of money for the, the potential impact on kids. Um, this question, again, in, ter in terms of trying to solve the substitute issue. Um, while certainly two in-house substitutes would not solve all pieces, it would give us two people in the district that we know that we have in-house that we could deploy that are well-versed with our schools and our programs and that type of thing. There is a differential between what we would pay Kelly services and what these folks would be making, and it's basically the benefits. Um, so is that something the board would like to support? Um, uh, Joe and Mike had about a four-hour marathon session to go through all the building maintenance. Um, we've now, Joe's been in this position, um, this is his um, second year, and it, it, we've got more data about what's needed in those building maintenance budgets. So some, some potential increase there. And then finally, we have gotten the engineer reports for the Prosper Valley HVAC system. That has come in at $100,000 for the HVAC system. And the additional operating cost has um, been estimated by engineers to be $8,000 per year. So those are all other possibilities that could be considered. Okay. Um, questions? Uh, for Mary Beth about these, we don't have the numbers associated. You know, tied I to actually the have all the numbers. Oh, if we okay. if we need that, it's you know this again is such a work in progress. So it was more of a exposure. Like here are some yeah. things that we can consider. If people have specific questions at this time, I'm I'm happy to answer. But we wanted to just be sure that people knew what potential things. Were yeah, yeah. Is on the, um, are there. Are there some questions about about these additional investments? Um, can answer them. Uh, yeah, in terms of the substitutes, the two in-house substitutes at the para rate. So um, substitutes at the high school level, same as substitutes at the elementary school level. Has that always been the case? No, no, no. This is the first year where they are now standardized between okay. both levels. What's changed in terms of, was it certification at one level? Uh, no, they, again, I, I think that that's more of a function of not being merged and different boards had to d d determine different <coughs> substitute rates. And okay. so we have now worked to have a single substitute expense across the district. And what I have asked Mary Beth for, what the finance committee did uh, and Mike is really an analysis of what are we spending on substitutes, you know, um, how many, subs, you know, what was in our budget for substitutes, what are we paying Kelly services for substitutes, um, you know, so that we can really, we can intelligently decide. I mean, it, it is going to be, it would be an, ink, it might, I mean, Mike's got to, we need to see the, you know, the, the Kelly versus. Um, well, to be clear, we won't have Kelly data in its entirety yet. Yeah. Right, what we will have is, what did we have from a salary perspective? Because Previously, substitutes were part of our staff, extended staff. Yeah. They were paid through the compensate or salary line of our ERP system, ADS. Now we're not doing that. We just hire third-party service, as we know. Yeah. And I don't have a full year of action, yeah, but no, at I least, know. if nothing else, we can compare. What have we paid last year on the salary line for substitutes? We can model what two potential full-time employees would be. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of this year, I can say this is what Kelly charged us. That's yeah. The best I can do. Yeah. So I think there is a there's a real discussion about that. What there has been, um, I I've heard it, I've heard it at least, um, I, I've heard it from a principal and, and sort of seen it in action. I think we really have. It, you see it. It's in every paper. Look in the classifieds. Kelly's got. I mean, everybody's trying to find substitutes. You see. I mean, we've got the sign outside the central office. Um, I have I have seen the principal. In Killington, substituting on a very regular basis in a classroom, like 
that is not the best use of our principals in the classroom. You know, so we've got to figure out um, any of us who 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 do hiring or or own a business, you know, know what how terribly difficult it is to find um, employees in Vermont, and substitutes are no different, you know, and and arguably really key. All of us hear from our kids, you know, what's that, bat, what's that, what are they saying to you when they get home when there's been a substitute, right? I mean, we all hear it. Sure. So, you know, it's really wasted opportunity and time in the classroom, and so, you know, we've really, it, it's a problem that we're trying to solve, because it is, a, it's a problem on a daily basis for our principals, for our secretaries in the schools, and, um, we, you know, we've got to see, we've got to be creative. Is there a way that we can, we can get people who better know the curriculum, the school, the kids in those classrooms rather than just random people sitting there babysitting. So, yeah, Pamela. I, I guess Melinda's question makes, brings up the, the question of the specificity of some of the high school, like, yeah. oh yeah. so is the same person going to be teach, substituting first grade one day and like pre-calc the next day? Because that seems uh, I think that they, challenging. The, the likely scenario here is that we would have one person who would be identified as an elementary substitute that would be deployed in our elementary schools and one person that would be um, identified as a middle school, high school person. Thank you. So we'll, we'll sort of see. You know, I mean, I think the substitute issue is out there. Jim? So this person that will be dedicated to the elementary school, wouldn't this just be like when we listen to music and language teachers that come to us and say they're traveling all over the place, so today they have to be in Killington and tomorrow they have to be in Barnard or Reading or wherever. Um, second, you said you had the total number for this. Can you just give it out to us? Yeah, so the, the differential between 175 days at the Kelly sub rate. No, no, I mean for the additional investments. You said you had all of them. Oh, what I, what I have is the, the individual costs for, for each of them. So could you total it up? Um, the way that I currently have it, because I had some of the other ones mixed in here, so I couldn't do that right off the top of my head. Um, I think the bottom two things in particular, the increased building yeah, maintenance so costs and the Prosper mm -hmm. Valley. You yeah, know, so a, a couple of, of things there. You've got the Prosper Valley that's looking at um, about $108,000. Yeah, we know that. Just, yeah. um, then if you look at the building maintenance costs, we um, we are currently looking at that being about a, a hundred k um, Substitutes run about 37.5. The theater tech director runs uh, 15. Um, the the assigning of additional responsibilities would run about 10. Um, department chairs, let me find that one, would run about 2022, and 6,000 for the additional days for the coaches. So we're talking about $234,000? Yeah. Okay. And then since I still have a floor here, and I sit on the finance committee, Jennifer, um, this has nothing to do with finance. It has more to do with uh, point of order here. Um, I do sit on the finance committee board. When there is talking about this, I just would like to have a clarification. Is it only one person that will be talking when their committee is up? Or are you going to be looking for information from each and every person in there? Because I was, I'm on this finance committee board. I put a lot of work into this committee. I was making an explanation. I'm getting called out. So if the policy meeting group has just one person, I'll be glad to let Pamela speak. Then I will just follow the rules of I can only raise my hand twice for a few minutes. But the same thing for every other group. That's it. I mean, I would like to know what the rules are. Okay. And I think this, what we have traditionally had at the beginning of the meetings when we've had uh, chair reports, it's been one person. When we've discussed, I mean, usually, to be honest, most committees don't have a full part of the meeting with their other than policy on a regular basis. It seems to me policy has had multiple people speaking to describe the policies, to explain them. Um, I think on the budget, it's certainly helpful to have all, all four of us who are on that finance committee, if you have anything extra to say, absolutely to say it. I mean, it usually makes sense to have one person 
giving the general explanation. But of course, the four of you are on the committee as well. You're welcome to chime in. You're welcome to give explanations. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Um, I think though that that number, <coughs> um, so you know, these are these are the numbers associated with the additional investments. I mean, this is a this is a first look in my mind. I mean, until. And I, I would say these are very, very fluid numbers right here. The maintenance piece, there's still some looking at reserves and how that might play in. Um, so, the, you know, the idea here, you know, and I think that Paige, you had talked about that, is that instead of people hearing about a particular idea that may come forward as a strong recommendation for the first time in January, to start to just put these ideas out there. Um, I think that, that no one would think that we are, would be in the position to fund all the common then and that kind of increase. Um, and you know, as the budget continues to evolve and we get, um, we get clearer in terms of what we actually have, some of these may or may not be coming back to you in terms of possibilities. So, one point. Um, you know, Mary Beth, would it be possible to like rank order, especially the first four, because all those kind of have to do with improvements in educational quality that you're proposing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it might be good for the board to understand which ones you prioritize the most. Okay. The next three kind of fall into different board topics that we need to discuss and probably fall outside of that purview. But that might be helpful just to let us know, you know, these are all priorities, but which are the most important? So that if we have an opportunity to do something with the budget, um, what would we choose over something else? Sure, absolutely. Done. Some other questions and comments. Well, I know it's a popular. But the other side of that coin is um, if we have to make tough decisions about things to cut, um, is it also appropriate to, you know, ask you to come up with a list of things that potentially um, projects that could be deferred or other ways that you could find money to uh, implement top priority initiatives? Yep, absolutely. <coughs> Good point. I, I mean, I, I see you with your hand up. I mean, you have a, you have one question in particular mm -hmm. for a comment. A comment. Um, Some recommendation for the budget committee. I certainly. Well, yeah, yeah. Two I, minutes. Uh, I talked to Joe uh, earlier this evening, and the numbers he came up with for the Prosper Valley HVAC system and uh, first year of operating costs seemed a little lower than the 108. But in any case. Now that the essential work has been done on the drainage, it's working right now, there's cleanup work to do, but it's working. It seems crazy to go into next budget year putting an HVAC system in without at least five or six grand for testing to see if it's working. You can't do the testing until you clean the mold out of the system. So Joe originally came up with 40 for that, and recently he said it's probably a lot lower than that. Could be as low as 30. If you had the 30 plus the five for testing, I think it's crazy to go forward into a whole nother year without seeing if the work we've done and the money we've spent, to your credit, is working through the summer and into the fall so that a year from today, we'll know beyond a question of a doubt whether we can go forward with the school, whatever it might be, get rid of it, uh, K through three or whatever. I know the district is all benefiting from the cost savings of having all the Pomfret and Bridgewater kids at Wes. We know that, but I don't think it's doing those two communities justice to continue to take advantage of that when we've already done the work to fix the essential part of the school. So I think we really need to do testing and the deep clean that Joe has recommended, which means basically adding about 30 or 40 to the 80 that he estimated. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment. And I think um, as mm -hmm. I was uh, typing up my minutes from the Finance Committee meeting on Friday today, uh, one of the things um, the Finance Committee needs is for Joe to come talk to to, to us and then to the full board about you know money now this this 100 the increased building maintenance cost is that 
an increase over over what was put into building maintenance costs last year? Or is that just a hundred? Um, we went through line by line, every, every town, every location, and the different requirements needed to run that location. What we discovered is, is the following. Unfortunately, compared to last year's budget, not actuals, just the budget, we found we need about another 100,000. Like, oh, geez, what? 100,000 is as follows. 70,000 for snow removal. Um, I can't find where snow removal was budgeted for. It's not to say there wasn't a separate fund somewhere in last year, but I just don't know where it is. So 70,000 is that, and the 30,000 is just spread across the different schools and the different requirements for both building and equipment maintenance. Um, so that's where that extra 100 as of right now. And we're going to continue to scrub, as I am with, I meet with Gretchen tomorrow for food service. Uh, I meet but with RAF tomorrow with IT. I believe last year we took, it was an extra 150000 and put it in building maintenance reserve. I know that's been spent. Yep. Is this, an, is this, is that now $250,000? No. It's I, just a hundred instead of a hundred and fifty dollars from last year? Correct. I think that, so the, so the 150 we're talking about, the hundred I'm saying from last year. You're right. I think there's some kind of a, a capital, capital, a capital expenditure line item in the operating budget for capital spend. I, I want to double check that as I continue to go line item by line item and go through the revenue items which we don't have yet. Um, the auditors are actually helping. They were in today um, and there's, there's actually um, a website, it's all public information, where we can go validate what the state has given us uh, to marry up the revenue. Is that 150 though going back in this year? 150 into capital? I don't want to, I want to do further research okay. before I make any more comment on that okay. other than I was looking at pure operating expenses, non-capital expenditures, pure operating, and that, that was the year to year comparison okay. that I'm referring to. Okay. Patty, I'm um, missing. If I could just follow up on Bob's um, comments mm -hmm. about talking, um, and Bob, would you you can back me up because we met with Joe at the building a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and at that point my understanding was that he was happy where things had come so far that he was starting to see maybe some changes in some of the monitoring systems already with some of the drainage work that had been done <coughs> that he hoped that either by whichever way whether it came by budget or bond his next step was to get funding so that July 1, he could put the HVAC system in <coughs> and then watch that HVAC system be functional through the rest of the summer to then say the building would be ready, if, if that's where the direction that the, the board had decided they were going to go, would be ready the following year. Am I not remembering that correct, Bob, when he walked us through the building? Well, that's correct. And he, he had a number, he thought then it was 60, 60 to 80, but it sounds yeah. like it came out higher. <clears throat> is that the is that the number that you have that's seen? The, that's in an the one that Joe had sent me. Um, and one of the things that he had shared with me is that it's it's not just the <coughs> engineers. It's not just the HVAC unit, but there would need to be some vents kind of going out to different parts of the building, and that's what increased the cost to initial thoughts. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, and you, I think. You stated that it was going to cost eight thousand dollars a year to run the system. Additional, additional, additional. In addition, that's the addition amount. Additional amount in electricity. And then what? What's the original amount? It's what's addition the, to what's the what's Prosper Valley line item for electricity? I don't. Yeah, I, don't I was just exactly. curious. Yeah, like, basically what the engineer part. did was to just say this is what it's going to cost to run this unit, and <coughs> because it never existed before. That's yes, I was just yeah. curious what percent increase that is yeah. over the. Do you guys have any recollection of what you paid for electricity? You know, if it's like that, that's like it. No, it's just sixty-eight thousand dollars more. That's sixty-eight thousand less. I mean, we <laughs> had just put in all new lighting fixtures in that building yeah. right before all this yeah. happened, so that was going to come down from where yeah, it was. Yeah, so who knows what it yeah. I was just curious yeah. how big of an increase that is. I don't know, but that's, it's a good question. I think at one point we were told it was 20000 because we were told that there was a three-time increase on it, and we were looking <coughs> at sixty. I think it's, I mean, Killing, Killington, like three years ago, was spending about $17,000 a year on electricity. It's a pretty similarly sized building, so I would put it in that range, I'd say. So that's, that's about 50% increase. 30 40% increase, yeah. So. 
I don't know exactly, but I, you know, it's a sizable increase. Um, okay, so I mean, I think you know we need we need Joe. <laughs> you know, um, any other anything else? Anybody? Any additional comments or questions on this? Okay, we'll meet again on Friday. Everybody's welcome who can and wants to make it to 8 or on Friday morning over at the SU office. Um, and uh, and can you give us a, is there any kind of update? Of when, when do you think we might have some kind of revenue numbers? Um, yeah. Okay. So it's all deliverable. I'll, I'll try yeah. to put something together. Um, it's not the end of this week, it, it, early next. Um, okay. yeah. I, I lost a whole day today spending lovely time with the auditors, so that was a lot of fun. How are we doing on, um, and you feel we're doing on uh, tuition collection? Yeah, so the good news is we sent out the first 50% of the tuition invoice in for the different towns. Of course, um, they just went out last week. Yeah. I haven't seen any checks come in, but I, I feel confident we'll collect every dollar um, that is eligible to be collected, yeah. of course. Um, so I, I feel good about that. I have no reason to believe we won't collect the tuition dollars. And do we, is it, uh, we do a 50% fall, 50% spring kind of bill? Well, that's the way we did it this year because of the late start we had. Okay. Um, just trying to align it with where we should be at this point. Yeah. Usually we bill it, I think, three times a year, or maybe it's four times a year. But being December and having it not yet invoiced um, due to the transitional issues, yeah. I would say it was better to serve the, our district with the 50%. So provide half now, yeah. since that's where they would be had we been on time. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Any okay, other questions? Okay. I, be part just, two next week. Yeah, Bryce. I just specifically, I guess, a couple. I was just looking at last year's real quick, and and just some things to note. I mean, we've talked about TPBS, um, the food program. I know we got an update from Gretchen at some point, but I just want to make sure since we were actually doing better than we originally budgeted, budgeted in the last budget and stuff. Maybe just to make sure that evaluation's in there, because it was to the tune of we were off by one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So whether it goes one way or the other, it'd just be good to make sure we have pretty solid numbers around that. And you're meeting with Gretchen, you said. Yeah. And then it's a revolving door. <laughs> so yeah. one, yeah. one the other two Good things point. were the standardization of unified arts at all the schools, which I think was accomplished. But I just wanted to pose you don't want an answer, but just make sure that that's kind of been accomplished since that was a goal. Um, and then the Spanish situation, which I think we're all aware of, but whether that's something that the administration is recommending we stay with for another year or we revisit as we said we were going to. You know, um, I think the Spanish is something we're going to want a definitely want a, a uh, report back on. I think it's probably preliminary at that, this point. It's December, you know, sort of to get something in the in the spring. Um, it'll be it'll be um, budgeted as it is right now with the necessary um, comp and health care adjustments, but you know, status quo. The amount of money. Didn't we have a group of people come to us and we said that we would look into having Spanish um, in the lower grades into our next budget? Yep. So one of the things that we were able to do after that last meeting in June, we had talked about the fact that at the time we couldn't even find a second Spanish teacher. Um, so we, we were able to make some adjustments, um, particularly at at West where we had a full-time Spanish teacher. So there's something called a wind block, what I need block. And so there is um, <coughs> Spanish instruction happening at West for students in the younger grades. Um, other schools have chosen to handle it differently. I know at, um, at Barnard, they were able in their school only to run two days a week. Um, and so they, they've, they've had some additional ways that they've gone about it. Um, but that's, that's, we were able to provide um, at West primarily um, some additional time for the K through two, the K so, through two. So then picking up on that, <coughs> that answer, um, if we are a district 
and we set as a board the curriculum and the, and the school setting, um, how did we allow one school to do something and we did not allow the other schools to do it? And I just want to go to what, what Bryce has in front of him here is the actual um, pamphlet that we put out for the FY20 budget strategy. And if I come down to page um, eight, page seven, maybe. Right, this thing is long. There, it, it states in here, and I asked this question in financing: Is do we have? <coughs> did we get rid of for oh, investments? <coughs> investments for the community or whatever. Investments related to improved student outcomes. And it states, the only thing it states here is that this budget standardizes uniformed arts offering at the elementary level across campuses, including Spanish three times per week in grades four to six. We have art kindergarten through sixth grade. This, this pamphlet that was given out to the voters that all showed up here and repping us all a new one was how did we go from K through six to four through six? There's nothing in here that states that we were dropping it. And we listened to the community, and the community was asking for us to look into this next budget for Spanish back across the level. I don't see that into the um, what we're talking about right now. I, I got to yeah. say, I mean, when, how else would we learn that this change has happened, other than just it's getting brought up. I mean, there's a whole issue coming in the school year, and now we're just learning that there's not equanimity, of, you know, equality across the district. So there are problem-solving efforts that we make, right? So um, in this situation, we had a Spanish teacher at West that had some additional time in her schedule, mm -hmm. and we were able to make that accommodation in that particular way. Um, that is not something that we were able to do in schools that didn't have a, a full-time Spanish teacher. Um, so the question was, do you not, not do that, or do you utilize somebody's schedule to the fullest extent of the, the opportunity? Um, the, the primary concerns seem to be coming from the West, West community. So that was something that we had the ability to do. Um, there are other places, you know, so an example would be at Reading, currently there are like swimming lessons at, that nobody else has, right? So there are places in which, well, we are working really hard to standardize, um, and we, we are standardized in terms of the amount of time per week that every student gets in elementary level, the K through three and the four through six is standardized. There is something called wind block, what I need block. And depending on <coughs> the staffing of a particular school, the offerings that are available to students in wind block is going to differ. Um, and that is, a, that is an intervention piece um, that is in place in some schools, not all. Right? And Reading, given the size, it is not something that currently has a wind block. It just they, they do intervention differently. So there, and in Barnard Academy, the decision was that's separate from the merge district. Um, so they made a different decision in their schedule. So they are, they are dealing with that as a, a choice in their budget. Um, but wind block is something that enables students to have different opportunities, some enrichment opportunities or some remediation opportunities. But the opportunities that are available to students depend on the staffing of the elementary school. Can I just follow up? Or yes, I'm sorry. I, I just take real issue with this. I mean, we talked in your, your words last year, Paige, we got to make Reading a primary school. In here, we've dedicated extra resources to a K through six school, and it just it does it does not sit well with me. And I feel like we should have been informed of this, particularly in the context of not just what uh, West parents that came contesting why are we taking you know Spanish um, from K through three. So it just it that does not sit well with me. And I, I would hope that others take issue with this as well. 
if Adam, if I just because I, I feel like I need to follow up on that. When when we have scheduling, there are times where some of our specialist schedules have some extra time in their schedule, and we there is no way that they can travel. It's a very short amount of time, and we can either not use that time and say, okay, then nobody gets it, right? And we, we don't utilize that time. Or if somebody has the room in their schedule and they're in the building and we can figure a way to make it work, we try and do that. Um, so this is, this is something where we, we accommodated where we could. Everybody, you know, all of our schools are not set up exactly the same, right? We don't have full-time nurses in all of our schools. We don't have full-time counselors in all of our schools. We have to make adjustments based on the realities of different settings. But what we do try to do is maximize the resources that we have. And if, I, if we are sitting with somebody that has extra time in their schedule, not the kind of extra time that would enable them to travel to another school and back, the, the philosophy has been, let's utilize that time in a way that's, that's helpful. Um, so that's, this was not a decision to put back Spanish in one school and not another. But there was capacity within that wind block time to provide instruction for um, students in that school. So I, I do take issue with it too, but it's a little bit diff. My, my thoughts are a little bit different. I mean, because I, I, I don't, I, I concur that the, the, the curriculum, the programming, not everything needs to be exactly the same. And I, I understand that different schools have different. Enrollment numbers, there's lots of different issues, and I understand that, but I, I think Mary Beth has set up a, a, a kind of like, well, what should we have done, not take advantage of this? But I think the issue is that there should have been communication. If there was this opportunity, and what you're saying makes, makes some sense to me, because this was an issue with lots of parents coming and, and complaining and people were upset, I feel it would have been best to have heard from you that this solution had been found and that it satisfied the parents who were so concerned and it didn't even, you know, it was, it made sense in the way that you just described. Instead of hearing about it sort of now, like, wait a second, what? Um, because it's, it's such a sensitive issue to make sure that we have equitable programming and, and, and uh, curriculums. So. Uh, I just, I feel like it's, it's, it's putting pressure on that in a, in a negative way. Um, so I'm going to go home and apologize to my kid because my kid told me, yeah, the little kids at West get Spanish. I mean, so I, I agree entirely with, with this point here because I told her, no, you have no idea what you're talking about. And this is a huge issue at the board. And, and so... You know, I mean, honestly, so I'm like, you know, I look like a stupid idiot to my child all the time, but I, you know, we could look like stupid idiots to a lot of other people here by, by this lack of communication. And, and entirely because we did, we spent a lot of time on this as a board, um, taking a lot of um, opinions from people. And um, I think the communication thing is a problem. And I, I, and I completely um, empathize with the Reading I mean, it, it just it just doesn't look good, and it ha and might it have been something that <coughs> was easier to swallow if they knew about it before today? I think possibly. Can, can I just add? I mean, I, I do think that we we committed that we'd at least look into getting Spanish back. It was the recommendation of the committee you put together was to have it in K through six or one through six instead of just the four through six. So. We're not making any decisions now, but just getting a number for us to know what that cost would look like, I think would be appropriate, just like we're looking at numbers for these other potential things, and then we can talk about it more then. You know. I think what we looked at was about 170,000. Um, I would say that our continued recommendation would be not to do that, um, but we can certainly put that out there as a budget number, but, and I'll confirm that that's the Yep. Anybody else? I'm going to make one last statement here. When we started off in this Act 46 consolidation program and board, we did speak about having different schools, having different um, advantages that I might, with the school choice, and I could send my kid to this school because I wanted to pick up part 
I wanted to send this kid because this had a better music and this one might have had a better language. And I'm going to echo a bit the fact with uh, Pamela here about the, um, the communication that, you know, if we're going to have Spanish in K or 1 through 6 next year and it's only at Woodstock Elementary School, that we have that communication out there because there may be some families that live in a different area that will say, I would like to send my child to that school and I want to take advantage of, um, of that. And, and, and that's it for me. Because it's important to me that there's clarity around messaging, right? So there is not a specialist schedule in West for Spanish. Wind block is when there's differentiated pieces and kids go different places. This year in the schedule, that's something that we were we, we were able to do. I don't know if we'll be able to do that next year. So Does I every wouldn't want kid to take Spanish that K through no. three. No. So in in a wind block, kids are going to different places either to get some level of enrichment or remediation, and they pick different things. Right. So the innovation lab has a series of um, experiences that can be an enrichment. The, the Spanish has something. There's a number of different offerings, right? And it depends on when all the schedules are built out for all the teachers. Where is there room in people's schedules for that offering? That's something that we were able to do this year. Um, I don't know when all the schedules get built out next year. If that's something that we'll be able to offer within when. It is not a specialist subject that was assigned to us in no other school. So, so since I still have a floor here, um, my, uh, my understanding of wind block was to help enrich the children in the classes that we currently have. So if a child needed help with math or something like that, they could go to the wind, this wind block or whatever. If they had problems with history or anything else, they could go to. I did not know that they were going to be able to take a class that was outside of the school structure of no Spanish at all, K through three. I also would like to have another clarification of point of order since we're, we were saying that the board members are only allowed to have two times on each one. Does this also refer to the superintendent that can keep on coming back at us each time we have a question? It just, it just applies to board I, I think this is enough of an issue that we we should price up K through four. I mean, I, I mean, we did spend quite a bit of time, so it becomes at least an option for us to consider mm -hmm. one option amongst many impossible options based on the budget we're facing. But it ought to be there. Yeah. So. No, I, I, I'll, I'll definitely get that. Thanks. Like I said, I'm reasonably sure it was 170, but I will. Okay. Okay, anything else? First, look at it. Mm -hmm. Do this again in a week. Okay. Um, okay, uh, <coughs> policy. Oh, um, oh, I'm sorry, the uh, high school choice limit. Establish public high school Establish. choice limit. Um, so is this, um, we'll do a vote tonight <coughs> on this. Uh, Mary Beth, I mean, we don't have a vote written, but right. we now so, have we now have the information that we've requested. Um, uh, we have the we have the data we requested. Where these kids are in the high school, we have um, uh, Garen saying he doesn't have a strong recommendation either way. But here are some of the considerations. Uh, back on page four of the book. Some discussion on this. Yeah, we have a motion. Uh, I don't know if we want to set that. I mean, the number is set at ten now. Are we voting on this tonight? Or are we just having a conversation? Make a motion to move it to our next meeting. To move it to the next yes. meeting. To move the vote to the next meeting. We need the vote. To the next okay, we can. That's we fine. have the information in front of us. We can read it. That's fine. We don't need it now. Um, is there any? Any additional information that would be helpful for Mary Beth or Darren to have for us? We'll um, second Jim's motion. Thanks. Uh, yeah, could um, you provide the history of what the numbers have been over the last five years? Or, or 
six years, that would be great because I think 10 is too high. I think we should be at about five. Um, you know, a lot of these people move to less expensive communities and are able to then find a, a reason to send their kids to a better school system sometimes. Um, the kids who are on this list would be grandfathered in anyway, so their ties to us would not be severed. Um, but my recommendation is I think it should be lower than it is right now. I think 10 is very high. Okay, so we will, I'm sorry, yes, Bruce? Um, I just want to echo what I was saying before, and I guess maybe it comes along with the question, but um, you know, it's brought up in this that you know it could make class sizes too big but it can also help in other areas um if there's any known cases of that i mean i feel like our, our building and stuff is you know we're, we're much lower than we were a couple years ago right and uh i don't feel like we have a strain or we're not we're not um really short on teachers either you know so i guess i'd be curious if we see that being a problem because I still think more kids in the building is good, and that's our that's our goal. So, revenue bringing or not, if, if we're not near being over capacity, I don't see the the harm, in especially helping fill up, you know, fill up programs. So, um, I just more specifics, I guess. It's pretty pretty vague comments that are in there about it. Yes, it can hurt or it can help, you know. But what does it actually look like for us right now? Yeah, it, it, so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't help obviously the per pupil count when you get to the budget piece of it. So I don't know, Garen, if you've got you know some anecdotes about a time when a class was small and a school choice right. student helped, or if a place where there was you know fairly high enrollment in something and it could have been. Yeah. So for the previous middle school, high school board, I did a few analyses of this. So maybe I could bring that information back to another board meeting and show. So I did pieces around at what level would we really see needed at staff or at capacity pieces. So. Um, perhaps I could bring that back to the, the next meeting time to see it. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that you're asking is, so what, what's an anecdote oh, as far of as like, time. you know, so a cl and, and I'll, I'll take a stab at it and see if I, I, it would make sense. So if you had, let's say, um, an elective course that had 10 students in there, and you have a school choice student that comes in and decides on that elective, that adds to that class, and it, 10 is probably too small, right? So that that student adds something to that class. You may have a, in a contrary, uh, an English class, and you've got 20, you know, 24 students in it, and you have a school choice student that then comes in and could be um, adding an additional number there. Is that is that accurate, Garen? It's accurate. Yeah. It's um, basically it, it's hard to see that impact unless there are. I would say greater than 10 students in one grade level to really see that kind of effect. So usually when it's the way the students come in and so in the school of choice, they don't typically enter in one grade level, but they come in a variety of grade levels. And so without that sort of concentration, it's hard to see where it really makes like a, a bump on classes. So in an extreme case, you might have, um, you know, maybe we have a, a certain level of language class where we only have one section of that class. And let's say it's at 22 and that starts to get large in that way. Um, but it's hard to find those those special areas. So can I just follow yeah. this to follow up? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so to follow up, that's kind of what I was asking because really it's only one to two kids per grade. We have 85 kids, also we have 86. The curriculum, they, just because you choose an elective doesn't mean you get it, right? And it, and my kid doesn't. So <laughs> so you obviously have some shifting that you can play with there. So the, it might be a factor of wanting to limit per grade level versus the whole total because that would have the bigger potential negative impacts. If we can negate the negative, still get more kids in. That would be what I've been in favor of. But. To the extent you can provide it based on student privacy, I'd like to see, um, there's only 10 kids currently, at each of the bases for the applied school of choice application. Um, yeah, they don't really give it bases like that. It's, it's just the application is a state standard application. This request for the kind of move in, there isn't a, a real kind so of So last time we discussed this, um, yeah. some of the reasons for a school of choice right. application that were provided were uh, bullying in one school, I think, was, was brought up. Oh. Is none of that have to be it, part of their application? No, the, the, there, so those sort of comments might be made. Um, it, there isn't a requirement of having that sort of justification for a school of choice application. Um, I've had people come in and make those comments to say it, uh, but that's 
that's not. Is it really just first product. come first serve? It's really first come first serve. It's the way it's first come first serve, and then if you get into a case where it's competitive, you do a lottery system, which we haven't had to face. I mean, we could have. Well, we were full of this year because of as as patient students who are already enrolled. Okay. Cool. I guess I know what I need to know there. Yeah. So it's just first come first serve. I mean, they don't have to have a reason why. And as, as Mary Beth said in the beginning, too, the, if the students here on school choice, they don't have the same right, property rights that students who have who live in our district. So what that means is if things aren't working, it's much easier to say if things aren't working, you should go back to your home school, whereas if a student lives here, they have the full rights to have a school here. So it's a, a different relationship. Has that ever happened? Yes, it has. Yeah. But I think you got to listen, is that you can have 10, 20, 30, kids in this choice system, but they don't count towards your equalized per pupil spend, which is huge. Whereas you could go towards the 45 homeschool children in our district and get them instead, and they would count towards your per pupil spend. You have to start thinking about where do we want to target our students because you want the increases to go towards your per pupil, your equalized per pupil spend, so that it offsets your total budget and brings down that per pupil cost. That's something you have to, you should be considering when you look at those numbers on how many people can come in for choice without tuition following them. Just food for thought. Bob. Just go ahead. There's no state requirement we do this. No. Uh, do we offer any? Um, it's a statewide program, and as far as what the requirements are, I'm not we sure. To, it's mostly about losing. Do we have to have losing. an application process? Do we have to accept? I don't students? know what the minimum acceptance. There are straight, straight and good line, excuse me, guidelines around students leaving your school, mm -hmm. so you have to allow students to leave, and there's some provisions on there. Well, my um, question was, is this somehow reciprocal? Like, <coughs> do we have kids who leave our school district? Oh, have we had some? Yeah. yeah. Um, I can answer this because yeah, I actually I spent a lot of time in the law book looking at this over the last week. Statutes are really fun to read. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you as a board are required by law to set a, an amount to right. leave your school and that is a percentage. Right. Um, so you are required by law to do that. It is recommended you set a limit on, what, on how many you yeah. want to take, um, but there is no guidelines, there's no state minimums or maximums around how many you want to take you base it off of what you think your capacity is and the impact that it will have on your school i think tim needs to take you out to dinner because you're spending far too much time in law book <laughs> 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 okay. oh. it, the, the regulations regarding this are the last month's workbook so you can just take a look at those and see exactly yeah. Yeah, what time's based right out of statute for your last board yeah Elena. I'm sorry if this was already answered at the last meeting, but do we know how many applications we get? Typically. Um, so to go, so I would say this year, as far as hitting the maximum, was not the usual. Usually we, we don't hit our maximum. And to answer Paige's question, are, we've moved from, we've had times in the past 10 years where the max has been six, and we've had it where it's been 10. Um, I believe this is the first year we've, we've hit the maximum, so typically we get three to, to four requests per year. And we would have been higher, right? I mean, this year we didn't we take did have freshmen. Some. Yeah, this year we did have We, we, we did actually have turned that. quite we a few We did turn some away this year, yeah. We got it for a loop block in Sam. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I had my yes. hand <laughs> <laughs> I almost said that. I almost was like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, my uh, question is because I remember at the last meeting, you <coughs> said that, that there was no like requirement, minimum, maximum, anything. Well, what I'm wondering is, do we have any knowledge of like what the average is for school? Like, is ten is ten a lot? Do most schools only allow five? Like, are we on the higher side? Is there any way? Just because it's not it's not regulated, is there any way of yeah, knowing that. what that is? Yeah. And similarly we, sized high schools. Yeah, similar sized high schools. How many do they usually allow? Yep. Just curious. Okay, any other questions of panel? I guess I just wonder if it makes sense to make the decision based on the number of outgoing, you know? Reciprocal. Mm. Yeah. What did we say we had two? Mm -hmm. This year, is it two? Yeah. 
but that's probably a moving target, so it's hard to set our number at you know how many are outgoing. But um, okay, so we have. Yes. Is there any athletic overlay to this? Do we get requests from kids who want to play? varsity hockey or varsity football, and so they come to our school? Mm -hmm. uh, typically that's as a member-member member agreement. They stay oh, at their okay. school and do it, so it's really discipline-driven by sports. There may be an, an aspect of it, but there's neither it happening for that. Okay. Well, yes. the kids don't play sports. No, they so can, can, but it's not, I, don't, I haven't seen that as, a, as an overarching, like a, a usual sort of piece. I, we have a request to apply in our teams through member-member member agreements that come through, where they stay enrolled at their home school, but because they don't have that um, athletic team. team, then they can do it. That's right. When the other school, when the high school doesn't, they're right. at, doesn't offer right. that sport. That's when they do this agreement to the VPA. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, we'll get we'll get some more answers next month, next week. But um, the the goal will be to vote on this uh, to to set a number next week. Do we need a vote to move it to next week? We do. Yeah, yeah. the motion to table. Next month. Right. Okay. Right. Nice to meet. Good good question. Question. We need to vote on that. There was a motion okay, on the table with a vote to move. Okay, and it was seconded by Ben, so now those in favor of the motion on the table to table this till next week and can vote on it. All aye. 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 All opposed? Say the ayes out. Um, okay, great. Now, um, policy. Okay. Um, so I forgot to mention that our next policy meeting is Monday the 16th at 8 o'clock in the morning. So. Uh, be there if you would like. Um, and we just have two policies on second read tonight. It's no, no, vote. Votes. Vote. No, you're warned to adopt. And it's to adopt. adopt. Yeah. <laughs> Not a second. Um, uh, so I think, um, I guess somebody could make a motion to. I'll make a motion to adopt the board member stipends. I second. Okay. Any discussion? Yeah, where does it, how far back does this go? Has this always been part of what we do? Board members have been something new, I'm asking. It was all over the place. Okay. I mean, different, different schools had all different, I don't think there was a policy on it. Before the merger, some schools had stipends and some schools didn't, and they were varied, very, very. Okay. Um, and then um, last year, I believe, uh, this was voted in at the annual meeting. Um, it starts July 1. Of and it year. starts July 1 of this year. And I guess I got my concern is how does, I mean, I, I count up approximately what, 40 grand worth? 46. $46,000 46. worth of stipends that come out of the budget. How does that compare to what's, ever, what's come out of the budget in the past? Help that. Well, we're a much bigger board, so. I'm just concerned that everybody did it for free before. The, we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about plugging a $50,000 line item into the budget when we're also at the same meeting, we're talking about going into penalty. My concern is that this isn't, we're, we're feathering our own nests. This is a valid concern, but this was voted in, um, like in March, so um, we could talk about it. I think so was we I. should have this so. next March. Yeah, we we can well, have, we'll have this. Has I to think be, this you have to have an annual. Discussion yeah, this will be an this. annual decision. So okay. this conversation is valid to, to the you know your concern is valid to our next time that we vote on it or the public votes on it. Um, but in terms of, I mean, I guess you could vote as a protest if you didn't like this, but um, but it's already passed. And there's no no money is associated. No set amount is associated with this policy. This just allows. For, for board member stipends. So, so since I sit on the policy committee with, okay, the, first of all, this comes out of the SU budget, okay, which now doesn't go towards their per pupil penalty phase. It doesn't even go to, I believe. Um, second, there was a vote in March of 2018. It was not March of, two, oh, no, it was March of 2019. I'm not sure if you, you might have just got on the board, but there was, there was a vote and it passed through. Um, I don't even know if this is in the budget for this up next coming year, and we'll be talking about that in finance, and that your question might be answered that maybe the board will decide next year not to, and that's why this states here that um, it will be deemed annually by the electorate. So maybe, maybe it will not be voted in at this next March meeting. I don't know, but for now, this March, for now, we have it voted in, we were directed as policy to put a, uh, a policy together for how the payments were put, going to be done. This is what we have come up with. 
And it also states if you do not want to take the funds, you just don't fill out the paperwork. Mm -hmm. and, and some of us are coming here four or five times or eight to ten times a month. So if you don't have this, then we have the travel reimbursement one up that's next. So um, we would have to change this because in the travel reimbursement, it is a statutory, or the Vermont says that this is one of the ones we need to have. And in here it says that board members will be uh, reimbursed for their travel. Well, it says they won't be reimbursed no. we, if, if we have this. So if we don't they have this, then we have this. Thank you. No. Yeah, no. But, but the important issue, too, in addition to the actual policy, is where the money is going to come from. You know, this is, as Jim pointed out, this is a WCSU expense. But um, you know, we need to the policy committee. We need to talk about this on Friday, where this money is going to come from, and you know what we should plan on for next year. So, Jennifer, may I ask a clarifying yeah. question? Yes. So you are a mud board. The stipend was voted on at a mud annual meeting by the mud district, and this is a mud policy. So how is this a WCSU expense? Well, this has to be a mud expense. How is this a WCSU expense? Because Barnard is included in the expense. And it but Barnard's only part, Barnard is part of the MUD, 7 to 12. Seven. So they are part of this MUD district, 7 to 12. We didn't hold the WCSU vote on it, I don't think. Or was it, it was a, a Yeah, because the WCSU decision. didn't vote. Pittsfield didn't get a vote because they're not on the MUD. So, I mean, I don't understand how this is a WCSU yeah, expense. We need clarification. So, we need to look at so, 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 Jennifer. It sets back to the mud anyway. I'm sorry, Mike. The, 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 a, good, a good chunk of the WCSU expenses get assessed back to the mud and Barnard, depending upon, right? We have administrative costs. We have IT costs. So, yes, you can vote on it, but it's going to come back to the mud in some capacity through an assessment, which is going to increase cost. But it matters in terms of the legality of it. I mean, if if if, if the voters voted on it as a the the voters did not the vote mud, on this. Yes, they did. They did. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. One, one minute, please. But I think Mary Beth might be able to shed some light on. Yeah, I mean, I think that the the challenge with this and a lot of things is we've been kind of operating as a mud slash WCSU board, kind of with the the thinking that. That Barnard is going to come in. So, as a, there has not been, I think by design, really clear demarcations in meetings between WCSU and MUD. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think at the organizational meeting, there probably should have been a WCSU section and then a MUD section, but it was done as The well. WCSU is in its own district, so that's it won't true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah, so you're right, it would have, would have been voted in at the MUD level. Yeah. You know, it, that's so. In terms of the stipends, that could change if you decided to vote it at the WCSU level. But that, once the Barnard vote takes place tomorrow, we'll know whether or not we're going to have to get much clearer around. I was going to say, that and, that, and that's going to be a decision. We're going to. Have, I mean, that's something we're going to have to do. We'll see. If Barnard is voting tomorrow. We'll see. And if hopefully they hopefully they vote to join. If they don't, it, we do need to really. We need to start having separate meetings. But well, yeah. not to get too crazily complicated, but if Barnard joins and then the process of dissolving the SU begins, but that's not immediate. And since this vote took place before that, it doesn't seem that it would automatically follow that we could act retroactive about where the funds came from if the voters voted under the auspices of one entity. That just seems pretty slippery. I don't know. I, I look at the, I, I was saying something just that in general we're going to have to relook at this if, if Barner doesn't vote. I think we need to, we absolutely need to clarify, uh, to take a look back and see how we voted on this, um, where this money needs to come from. Well, it was voted, it was voted by, from the district. District. Voters. Mud district. The, mud the district mud voters. District. So that saying that it's got to come from. The, Budget. Our district budget. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, and we're here today to vote on a policy that was voted in by. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's to come up with a policy. It's it's not the the dollar amount will vary. It's yeah, this is just policy. to come up with a policy. Right. So, is there further discussion about the policy? Call the question. Okay. All those in favor of approving the board member stipend policy? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Aye. 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 Okay. You guys have it. Do we have two names? Uh, three. 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 So the next policy um, up for adoption tonight is travel reimbursement. Um, I'll make a motion to adopt. Second. And is this the same? Is this a, a standardized one? This is standardized except for we put in because of the um, previous motion that we just had yeah. that you cannot, we added in that if you're not taking, if you're taking the um, stipend, you, you cannot put in for the mileage. Yeah. Okay. Is there any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Um, the travel reimbursement policy, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Nay. Three nays. Aye. I think this was a, 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 a mandatory policy. Yeah, Do we, we should have clarified that, sorry. We did. We did? Yeah, I said it was. Okay. The only thing that we changed differently was that if you voted in for the other, then you, were, you can't vote no. <laughs> okay. Why don't we um, Why don't we do executive session now, and then we'll and then we'll do reflection.